Good morning, everyone. It's 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. This is Yahoo Finance Live. Here is your morning rundown. The latest strike. GM withdraws its 2023 guidance thanks to uncertainty around contract talks with the UAW. So far, the automaker says the strike has cost $800 million. Even so, it still managed to beat on the top and bottom lines, but with no contract agreement on the table yet, the road ahead is still uncertain. CFO Paul Jacobson says that strike costs are now running at $200 million per week. And success in a bottle, Coca-Cola raising its full year outlook in response to strong demand. Now adjusted earnings beat the street in the quarter, signaling customers are still willing to pay up even in the face of price increases. Notably absent from the earnings release, any mention of pressure from weight loss drugs. And we've peaked. The International Energy Agency predicting global demand for oil will reach its highest point this decade, topping out at 102 million barrels per day. Why? Well, electric vehicle popularity and a weaker crude appetite in China, two of the factors. One official called the transition to clean energy unstoppable. Well, today's morning driver, shares of GM moving higher pre-market after the automaker released its third quarter earnings this morning. Despite GM beating the street's expectations, the company withdrew its 2023 guidance over labor strike uncertainty. GM saw Q3 operating profit of $3.6 billion and earnings per share of $2.28 from sales of more than $44 billion. But the road ahead for General Motors remains bumpy here. The company said it lost $800 million in operating profit over the UAW strike and expects to continue to lose $200 million every week as workers remain on the picket line. Yahoo Finance Executive Editor Brian Sazi spoke with GM Chief Financial Officer CFO Paul Jacobson on the strike's impact behind the company's latest earnings report. Here's a clip of that. The tactics and the strategy of the UAW um, have, uh, you know, caused us to withdraw our guidance for the full year. Uh, that's predominantly just based on the uncertainty and the scope and the duration of what the work stoppage is. And we don't want to speculate on how long that might be. Um, clearly, we're at the table and we want to get people back to work uh, as quickly as possible. You know, the underlying business is performing well. Um, before we took this action, you know, absent the strike, we would have been performing at the top half of our, our guided range. Um, so the business Business continues to perform, but it does present some uncertainty that we thought the prudent thing to do was to withdraw that guidance. And of course, here, as we think about GM and continuing to track shares, even here pre-market, of course, the company also having its call with investors, with analysts this morning here, trying to dispel or at least give a little bit more data and detail around just how long this could potentially impact them for and where they stand in negotiations right now. Yeah, exactly. And I think the last thing you said there, where they stand in negotiations, because I think a lot of people were a bit hopeful on Friday when we right. did hear the latest from Sean Fain, the UAW, saying that they were getting closer to some sort of deal. When you take a look at what is on the table from all three automakers, they do have a uh, pretty significant pay raises within their latest offers. Union has 23% raises on the table from all three of the automakers, but reportedly they're pushing for higher. They're pushing for more. Latest reports saying that they would be satisfied with a 25% raise. On the flip side, automakers want to make sure that they're able to still obviously increase their margins as much as possible. They don't want to see these new uh, negotiations pressure their margins too much, new uh, agreements, I should say, pressure the margins too much. A CEO, Mary Barr, saying in a letter to shareholders here that GM needs a deal that will allow the company to achieve that 8 to 10 percent adjusted profit margin targets in North America and accepting unsustainably high costs would put our future and GM team member jobs at risk and jeopardizing our future is something I will not do. So I think the latest uh, commentary that we're getting from executives here from GM today, also following on the heels of what we heard from Sean Fain uh, yesterday with the expansion of the strike against Atlantis, still a lot of unknown just in terms of what exactly that timeline yeah. is going to look like. We talk about the fact that it's already taken a pretty significant financial hit, all three of the automakers from this strike. The fact that GM saying that it can, that sees itself losing about $200 million a week from the UAW strike at this point just shows how big of an impact these walkouts are having. Yeah, it's really interesting the duration of the strikes that we've seen over the course of this year, and it really points to a more empowered employee or one that has more of a bargaining chip considering some of the massive overhauls, at least in strategy or in targets that 
that companies like GM have, or even if you think about entertainment, where streaming has more of the prominence mm -hmm. in some of those discussions as well. So you're looking at a, a more empowered employee and coming to the negotiation table knowing exactly where some of the larger players like GM, like Ford, like Stellantis in this auto manufacturing industry is looking to make some of those larger changes, looking to lock in margins. However, that is going to be one of the larger questions for investors. And we've spoken with analysts about this very matter, just how long the strikes could last, because typically strikes in 2022, at least, based on some of the Cornell Labor Action Tracker, lasted less than five days on majority. And if you look back even further at where the BLS and Bureau of Labor Statistics had tracked this, going back to 1979, strikes were lasting about 32 days. Strikes that we've seen over the course of this summer and now for the automakers, this one is now over a month and change. And so mm -hmm. if this continues to move forward, continued impact on the profitability side for a company in GM, Ford, Stellantis, but also this takes a toll on a local economic level as well here. So there's a couple different areas and realms to continue tracking this going forward. Yeah, and we certainly will. Well, keep it right here on Yahoo Finance because we are going to be hearing more on GM's latest results from GM CFO Paul Jacobson. That's coming up 9.30 a.m. Eastern time this morning, an interview you certainly will not want to miss. All right, well, the bond market is rebounding just a bit this morning. When you take a look at the yields, at least pulling back to just around 4.8%, this comes as speculation rises that maybe the recent sell-off may have been a bit overdone. Now, billionaire investor Bill Ackman saying on Monday that he's getting out of his bet against long-term government bonds, saying in a post on X, quote, there is too much risk in the world to remain short bonds at current long-term rates. Now, as yields pull back, equities are getting a little shine with the tech-heavy Nasdaq leading the march higher ahead of Microsoft and Alphabet earnings after the bell today. So can these tech earnings live up to the hype and turn the markets around? For more on that, we want to bring in Young Yuma. He's BMO Wealth Management Chief Investment Strategist. It's great to see you, Young Yuma. Let's talk about the latest dynamic right now in the market because, yes, a lot of the, fo the focus later on today is going to be on the, uh, the tech earnings that we'll be getting from Google and that what we'll, the results that we'll be getting from Microsoft, but pairing that with the movement that we've seen in the Treasury markets as of late, how does that set us up here for the final two months of the year? Well, there are a mix of risks going on right now. I think that's what the market's grappling with. We don't know uh, where bond yields are going. There is two-sided risk. I, I think there's still some risk to the upside if uh, the geopolitical concerns kind of wane a bit here. But there's also risk to the downside for yields um, if some of these concerns become more acute. So I think that continues to be a driver as well. But what happens with earnings, tech earnings, certainly are going to be a big deal. That's carried the market this year, and there's going to be an intense focus uh, on these earnings to be able to kind of lead the way as the generals in the market here. It's carry the markets because of the expectation that AI would also be a major contributor to some of these companies' future financial performances, that getting priced into valuations. Do you think that we're overstretched at this point? And if so, are we expecting some type of rug pull? I don't think we're overstretched. I, I think the, the market certainly has high expectations for these companies, but in terms of the future prospects and how AI plays into that. But I don't think they're overdone here. I think there is great promise. I think uh, these mega cap technology firms are very well positioned to capitalize uh, on trends going on. And, and the strength that they've had previously, I think, is going to continue into the future. So uh, there is an element right now where uh, deep pockets and uh, you know strong market power is certainly adding to uh, their prospects going forward. And I think that'll continue to be the case. So do you think then, I guess, these earnings results maybe hold heavier weight with the markets, at least short-term direction right now, than the massive rise that we've seen in yields? Is that right? Well, I, I think both are in play, right? Both are in play. I think in the, as long as yields are not rising, if yields, uh, the 10-year Treasury yield, for example, stays stable where it is, then I think there can be a renewed focus on earnings, uh, what the trajectory is for these mega cap tech companies and, of course, other companies uh, in the economy. But if yields start a uh, renewed climb, that's a sharp turn upward, uh, then the focus can shift a bit. That's what we've seen in the marketplace is really abrupt shifts in terms of the market narrative. And right now, I do think the yields are kind of a two-sided market. We actually uh, increased our duration in our fixed income portfolios just the other day as well. 
uh, to take a neutral duration rather than be short duration, uh, because we do think there's two-sided risk now uh, to these longer-term Treasury yields. But it's important for them to stay stable. If they continue to climb as they have been for the past few months, that certainly will pressure the markets here. Are you confident that they are going to stabilize? And I guess if not, we've talked a lot about the volatility, everything that, that is at play that's pushing yields higher here. If we do break back above that 5% level that we briefly crossed yesterday, how high do you see yields climbing? Well, we do think that the geopolitical risk, combined with what we actually expect to be a slowdown in the coming months, an economic slowdown, we think uh, some of the forward-looking data, some of the survey measures, some of the strains on uh, consumers, at least uh, among certain groups of consumers, we think those are starting to uh, starting to come into play, and we think the higher interest rates are starting to bite in, in terms of uh, constraining the economy a bit more. So we do think that yields probably around here, the ten-year Treasury yield faces headwind, a lot of headwind from going higher, not just geopolitical concerns, but probably a slowing economy over the next few months or maybe a couple of quarters. So you know, we we don't think it's likely that will go much past the 5% level. There's a lot of treasury supply. The other side of that story is just massive supply that has to be absorbed in the market. And exactly where demand meets that supply, it's a little bit tough to know, but we think with the geopolitical concerns combined with uh, slowing economics, it probably meets supply right about where it is now. How, how restrictive do you expect the Fed to continue to be? We don't expect the Fed to raise rates again. We think that uh, the Fed is probably at peak hawkishness right now. Uh, we don't think it's necessary to raise rates again. The, the interest rates and the quantitative tightening that's going on, along with bank lending standards tightening, uh, along with deposits leaving the banking sector, all of this is adding to uh, restrictiveness, uh, a lot of restrictiveness in the economy. So we think the Fed is going to recognize this and is recognizing this. And as soon as we start to get soft data, which we think is probably right around the corner, the Fed is going to see it doesn't need to raise rates anymore. So what do you like in this environment? We've already talked about tech, how much is riding on these earnings reports here over the next couple of days. Outside of tech, where are you seeing the opportunity? Yeah, that's a big caveat outside of tech, right? Because tech is certainly <laughs> uh, been the stalwart this year and probably uh, continues to gain a lot of attention and is a space that should do well. Outside of tech, we continue to like U.S. infrastructure. There's been a bit of a pullback. Uh, we, we think that the money going into infrastructure is going to be substantial for years to come. So we do like uh, companies that play into U.S. infrastructure or even an ETF that uh, plays into U.S. infrastructure. Uh, that's probably the, the next uh, most favorable area for us, actually, besides technology. Young Yuma, BMO Wealth Management, Chief Investment Strategist. Young Yuma, pleasure to begin the day here with you. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you. Thanks. Well, the rise of EVs is taking a toll on fossil fuels. Global oil demand will now reach its peak by 2030, according to the International Energy Agency, which says the world will top out at 102 million barrels a day in the late 2020s. Yahoo Finance's Inez Ferre has been tracking this and has even more of the details on this. Inez? Yeah, Brad, and that IEA report basically talks about the fossil fuel markets, how they have been volatile. You've got the war in Ukraine. You've got the war in the Middle East. You also have climate change that's going on. So this analysis is taking a look at clean energy initiatives around the world when we talk about solar, wind, and electric vehicles, and how those clean energy initiatives are basically impacting the fossil fuel market. So for example, in 2020, one in out of 25 cars sold around the world was electric. In 2023, that number is one out of five. So those initiatives are definitely going forward and we are seeing that impact. Now there are challenges when it comes to clean energy investments, initiatives that uh, comes through supply chain issues, cost inflation, which is what we've seen with a lot of these projects. It's almost like if you kind of think about your home renovation projects, they always cost more than what you budgeted for. And that is what we are seeing with this clean energy 
initiative, that a lot of these initiatives are costing more than what was anticipated and they're taking longer than what was anticipated. But the bottom line from this analysis is, is basically that the momentum for these clean energy initiatives are enough that demand for coal, oil, and natural gas should reach a high point before 2030. So if you take a look at the energy mix, that share of coal, oil, and natural gas in the global energy supply, that's been stuck for decades at around 80%. That starts to edge downwards and reaches down to 73% by 2030. So despite the challenges, despite the conflicts, despite the volatility that we are seeing in the overall energy market, fossil fuel dependency is supposed to peak before 2030, guys. And Inez, you briefly touched on this, but when we're discussing these green initiatives here from individual countries, I guess, what are we spe seeing on a country-specific basis in terms of how that's tied then with the decline that we're seeing in fossil fuel usage? Yeah, this, so this analysis took, took a, a look at the U.S. Uh, Inflation Reduction Act that was passed last year and the green initiatives in the U.S. And basically what it's saying is that 50 percent of new U.S. car registrations will be electric in 2030 because of this initiative. The other one is China. And China is the biggest consumer of energy by far when it comes to the, uh, countries around the world. And China has its own green initiatives. It's been a leader when it comes to electric vehicles, with solar, with wind power. And if you take a look at China's GDP, if it continues to slow as it is expected to slow down, then that will also bring down demand for fossil fuels going forward. So between the green initiatives that China is going through and also a slowdown in their GDP, you should also see fossil fuel demand uh, slow down or come down because of China. All right, something we will watch. All right, Ines Frey, thanks. Just about 15 minutes until the opening bell. Let's see a look at some of the movement that we're seeing ahead of that open and pre-market trading. Jared Blickery, what do you have? Crypto. We're at the NASDAQ. We might as well hit crypto right now, right? <laughs> well, look at that. Bitcoin is up 12%. That's, a, that's over the trailing 24 hours. That is an impressive move. Haven't seen anything like that in months. What's really important it is it has now cleared the 30,000 level, and I think we're seeing a bit of short covering right here. This is a three-year look, and I want to show you. Um, here we have these highs that we had in 2021, and I can draw a box around this price action right here. There's a tremendous amount of price memory and action in there, and guess what? we have now entered that area. So that means more gains are going to be difficult and probably uh, forged in fire, something along those lines. You're going to have to have some real catalysts here, not just short covering, but in fact, we do have some positive things going on in the market for crypto right now. And that is, uh, there's a lot of anticipation over a spot Bitcoin ETF that could be launched any day now. We're still waiting on approval from the SEC. We recently had this court opinion that was decided uh, in the appellate courts that that the SEC uh, was, would have to grant Grayscale Bitcoin a fair review to allow them to convert their Grayscale Bitcoin trust, that's the ticker GBTC, into a spot Bitcoin ETF. Right now it is a closed end fund uh, and it has not been tracking the price of Bitcoin properly for years because they have not been allowed to. So they want to change all that. There's going to be a tremendous amount of inflows into the crypto, whichever one comes out first, the very first crypto uh, ETF. And we're seeing some of those, uh, those applications from BlackRock. BlackRock already got a listing with the DTCC. That's an inside, in the weeds, uh, kind of inside baseball look there. Uh, but just to say, there's a lot of things happening right now because it is felt that we are going to get this Bitcoin ETF, the spot Bitcoin ETF imminently. And then whoever lists first, as I was saying, probably going to see most of the assets that would have been allocated to crypto just kind of flood that one ticker. So there is a huge race among the index providers. What I'm showing here are crypto stocks. And you can see in the upper left, Mara was uh, Marathon was up 12.76% yesterday. It's up another 13% in the pre-market. And for most of these guys on the top line, we're looking at pre-market gains of 8 to 13%. Haven't seen anything like this in a while, but I'm going to show you a, a three-year chart of Marathon Digital Holdings. You can see, uh, much like the price of Bitcoin, there is a huge amount of activity in 21-22, but unlike the price of Bitcoin, it has not been able to enter into this area of overhead supply just yet. So the stock's looking a bit weaker than Bitcoin itself, which is not, not 
to uh, understand it, which is understandable. Here's a very similar chart from Riot Blockchain, and then I'll close out. Let's uh, give you another one here. This is the Bit, Bit Digital offering uh, that is down about 12, 12 cents over the term of three years. So uh, we'll have to see what comes of this. Really interesting to see how this has played out, though, and the, and the enthusiasm that has been generated over the last 24 hours over something that we knew was, well, coming imminently. Yeah. I'm sure Long Island Blockchain or Ice T, however they're yes. calling themselves these days, are, are certainly upset about not being involved in this move here today. Jared, thanks so much for taking the time to break that down for us. Appreciate it. Everyone, stay with us for the opening bell here as we've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live this morning, everyone. Let's get into our movers. Coca-Cola going to be topping, and they have topped Wall Street estimates for its third quarter earnings this morning and raising its full year outlook. Taking a look at shares, they're up by about three and a quarter percent. The company expecting earnings per share growth of about 7% to 8% on the top end. That's compared to a prior range of 5% to 6%. A few things to break down from this quarter, especially as you're taking a look at some of the actuals versus the estimates and what was expected on your screen here. They mentioned that unit case volume had actually grew 2% for the quarter here. Some of the developed markets seeing that grow 2%, driven by growth in Mexico and Japan. And then for the products that are actually performing well, Sparkling drinks, sparkling soft drinks grew 2%. I know I'm involved within that just a little bit, primarily driven by growth in Latin America and Asia Pacific, which I am not involved in. However, trademark Coca-Cola grew by about 2% for anybody who's drinking more of those Coke Zero Sugar. That, that was up 3% as well. So sparkling flavors continuing to uh, get a little bit more of a bid here from some of those pantries or refrigerators, however you're storing your soft drinks at home. Yeah, what's amazing to me is just how much pricing power some of these companies still have. When yeah. you take into account how much prices have uh, have been raised over the last several quarters, the fact that they're still able to, in this case for Coca-Cola, even report volume growth, a volume rising just about 2%, which beat the street's expectations. Here in the U.S., though, it's a little bit more interesting or interesting, I guess, when you contrast it to some of the behavior from around the world. Because in North America, where prices have increased just about 5%, during the quarter, volumes were flat. So we can't read too much into that just yet, but it yeah. does kind of point to the fact that the consumer might be rethinking some of their purchases and thinking twice before, uh, before uh, 
Okay, so we're getting some comments, I believe, that the producer just said in our ear about the weight loss drugs right now. We know that that has certainly been a topic uh, across the board when it comes to consumer staples plays here over the last several weeks, what that is going to have, the impact that it is going to have on the businesses here going forward. And when asked whether or not they do see any impact that it will have down the line, uh, Coca-Cola is saying that I would offer if you do step above us and lock us on the thrust here of the total beverage strategy over the last few years are well positioned to provide choice, to provide options, essentially shrugging it off, similar to the tone that we heard from Pepsi here just last week when we got their earnings results. So again, at least for now, they're putting to rest some of those uh, worries that we certainly did see on the street. Yeah, said so that they continue to monitor the space, confident the total beverage strategy that they have, and then 68% of products have lower, no calories today continuing to invest in innovation and choice to deal with whatever comes out of uh, the weight loss kind of focus and the weight loss drugs that have been garnering the attention of a lot of the players in the food and beverage space here right now. So that getting a question on the call, but as you mentioned, uh, getting shrugged off and our own Brooke De Palma saying that this was a rather boring conference call here. I mean, it, it's com comments that you have like this. I mean, you ultimately want to hear where some of these CEOs, some of these executives are really passionate about where there are risk factors that they have to not just navigate around, but also perhaps lean into some of those those customers out there too. Yeah, and it also stems from what we heard from Walmart initially, right? The right, fact that they did yeah. see a little bit of a change in behavior in terms of how consumers were spending, those that were taking weight loss drugs versus those that weren't. So that was the initial uh, commentary that sparked some of this fear that we've seen play out on the street. But I think the big question is yeah. just what that uptake rate looks like, right? right in terms yeah. of how many Americans are actually going to use some of these weight loss drugs and then of course the broader impact on some of these companies. All right, let's get to Spotify releasing Q3 earnings this morning, raising its 2024 outlook and beating Wall Street estimates. This comes after the streaming platform doubled down on cost cutting measures, laying off hundreds of employees this year, making programming cuts and merging with smaller podcast studios. More on this, Yahoo Finance reporter Alexandra Canal is here to break this all down. Ali, we're looking at a rise of just about five and a half percent in pre-market trading. Yeah, Shauna, a really solid quarter here for Spotify. And in the first time in over a year, they reported a profit. We're making money, people. We're profitable. And if you've been a Spotify investor, you've been waiting quite a bit of time to see this moment. Spotify reporting net income of 65 million euros. Again, a significant beat considering the expectation on the street was that this would be a loss. Profits were boosted by lower than expected costs release related to personnel, marketing spend. In addition to strong margins in the quarter margins have consistently been a metric that investors have been focused on. We saw gross margins of 26.4%, slightly beating guidance of 26%. The company said it expects margins to tick up to 26.6% in Q4 before settling between 30 and 35% over the long term. And then on the user side, we did see total monthly active users tick up to 574 million in the quarter, also beating estimates. Spotify said those net additions of 20 3 million represented the company's second largest Q3 net addition performance in its history with premium subs also coming in higher than expected. Now, in a slightly uh, negative front, we did see average revenue per user for premium subscriptions decline 6%. Now, that was pressured by discounted plans, lower prices in emerging markets, but price increases will continue to offset those declines. But really, other than that, a very solid report. The stock did bounce around a bit in pre-market trading earlier this morning. There were some investor confusions that Spotify may have lost North American subscribers in the quarter, but that was actually not the case. CFO Paul Vogel clarified on the earnings call that rounding in the press release might have made that unclear. But speaking of that earnings call that just wrapped, Vogel did speak on that surprise profit turn and how there's more room to run. He said, quote, our expectations are now that we will consistently be in the black moving forward. Obviously, you never know what can happen in any one quarter, but we feel good that we're on a different trajectory and we've hit an inflection point with respect to profitability of the business. So again, very mm -hmm. solid report. It's great that we're finally making money. Really, the fourth quarter, we should continue to see all of those key metrics outperform. Free cash flow, another one that came in hotter than expected. So overall, you know, I'm happy. Spotify investors are happy and clearly the stock is happy right now as well. Yeah, Ali, music is my weight loss drug. I mean, 
Get that on a t-shirt, why not? Um, AI DJ though, I mean, my goodness, our own Julie yeah. Hyman uh, is a big fan of the Spotify AI DJ, so it was good to see that get a call out too. Um, so thanks so much for helping us break down some of these results here, Ali, appreciate it. All right, once again, we are digesting a slew of earnings reports before the bell this morning. Really one of the biggest uh, dictators here in the early action that we're seeing as we count down to the opening bell on Wall Street. Again, pretty solid results uh, more broadly across the board. We can take a look at some of that earnings reports that we're getting out from Spotify, like Ali was just mentioning. Also, Coca-Cola, that moving higher on the jump that we saw in 3Q volume, also pretty strong demand for the company. Let's head over to Jared Blicker. He's standing by at the Interactive with a closer look that we're seeing some of these individual movers, Jared. Yes, a lot of action here, a lot of green, not a lot of dark green, uh, but I think investors will take it. Just looking at the Wi-Fi Interactive, we got a couple of outliers here. Looks like Pin Duo Duo kind of in the middle. That's up 3%. Let's take a look at a five-day view. You can see trending down over the last five days, but inflecting up off of those lows there. Another one is Tesla. That's been on the move since its earnings last week. It is up off of its lows, but down 15% over five days. Just kind of shows you, uh, reminds you of what has happened and some of the carnage in the market that we've seen over the last five days as interest rates have just screamed higher. But I'll tell you what, they are backing off a bit today. Now, this is a 10-year T-note yield. Here's a two-month chart. What I want you to show, what I want to show you guys is the uh, candle from yesterday. That's that big red candle. It touched 5% or almost uh, within a hair of it. And then it just reversed off of that. That's a big outside candle. A lot of times those will mark interim inflection points, and we'll have to see what happens today. But uh, if we have inter interim yields ca capped at 5%, that would probably give equities some move to find their footing again and uh, move higher. If that doesn't happen, guess what? Equity is probably going to roll over some more while interest rates head higher. And that's the dance that we're kind of engaged in right here. Now, let's take a look at the sector action. Everything in the green except for health uh, healthcare and energy, those two sectors trading to the downside. But industrials uh, up 1.3%, utilities, communication services, materials, all four of those are up more than 1%. Let's take a look at the leaders here. In the lead, not surprisingly, is Bitcoin. Uh, Baito, that ETF is up almost 10%, but uh, we just covered that a few minutes ago. So we're going to move on. ARC is up 2.3%, so innovation catching a bid. So is China, that's KWeb. Uh, defense, that's ITA, also looking at some green there. In fact, everything here is in the green. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of huge action to the upside, so probably just a little bit of uh, short covering activity, and we'll just have to call it that until we see see some uh, manifestations of more uh, movement here. I said energy was one of the few sectors in the red, but we have a mixed board right here, uh, more red than green. It looks like Exxon and Chevron each down about 10, uh, one tenth of 1% or a little bit less. Here's the banking sector. Uh, looks like Barclays down about 7% here. Here's a five day look down 14, almost 15% over those five days, uh, but not a lot of other big movers in the space. I did mention ARC Innovation, and it looks like these components doing really nicely. Coinbase, that's uh, kind of right in the coattails of Bitcoin. That's up 7%. Uh, we have Beam Therapeutic, that's up 3.6%. DraftKings, uh, all in all, it's looking like a very risk-favorable day. We'll just have to see how it uh, ends, if it ends risk-favorable as well. All right, Jared, we're going to continue to watch that as well. Thanks so much, Jared, for that breakdown there. Well, it's Electric. General Electric releasing Q3 earnings and raising its 2023 guidance. The company attributing its success to the profitability of its aerospace and energy businesses this quarter. It is planning to launch those as spinoffs as independent companies in the second quarter of 2024. So we're finally getting some timing around that. You'll remember that they had announced that, uh, of course, prior to this actual kind of confirmation of the timing beginning in that second quarter of 2024 here and giving us a little bit more of the details around where GE of Nova will be listed. That's going to be on the New York Stock Exchange, ticker symbol GEV. And then aerospace is going to continue to list under the existing GE ticker symbol once we hit that timing here. But still, a lot of the movement that we're tracking here today also around the earnings results that have come out that our viewers are looking at right now.
Yeah, certainly. And this is just really the last major step when we talk about the spinoff plan that Larry Cove initially laid out years ago, the execution there on that and what exactly we have seen uh, over the last several years. In terms of what we're hearing in this report specifically here from Larry Culp, the CEO there, saying that GE's aviation operations are experiencing, quote, rapid growth driven by robust demand and also solid execution, largely in commercial engines and in services here. So, he has done a number of strategic moves, a number of strategic uh, spinoffs here over the last couple of years. He's sold a huge businesses. He's slashed more than $100 billion in debt, has certainly overhauled the business, what people think of when they do think of GE General Electric. So he has turned around the business. And you could see that in that year-to-date chart that we're showing right now on the screen, which shares up just about 69%, trading right around 110 bucks a share. So at least in terms of the streets reception, of these results here this morning. We're looking at an intraday move at the open, though, of up just about 4%. Yeah, the, the aerospace business here, and, and I think what this is going to give investors at least a little bit more of the ability to do is to, to separate how they're looking at GE specifically with regard to how much the aerospace business has been able to put the team on its back for years now, too. You think about even this most recent quarterly performance delivered double-digit growth in orders, revenue, and operating profit, really driven by some of that commercial momentum and strength in services, orders growing 34%. And then you compare that to ultimately what they're going to be watching with Vernova, which is an investment, but also a big energy play here. So driving revenue that they classified as strong plus operating profit growth and renewable energy and power. And I think that renewable energy segment too, that revenue growing 14% organically, that's where investors perhaps can separate how they want to play out any type of annexation or portfolio positioning around GE with these two as separate frames of mind in energy and aerospace as two separates going forward. But they got to wait till 2024. They do. Just about the second quarter of 2024, right? So we're not, not far. too far yeah. from that, at least at this point. All right, let's talk about another mover today, and that is Verizon raising its guidance in its Q3 earnings report out this morning. The outlook for the year looking a bit better. The tell communications company saying that it expects free cash flow to be above 18 billion that's about a billion higher than its previous guidance the company also reporting a beat here on the bottom line but it was lower than what the results that we got a year ago you're looking at revenue of just around 33.3 billion adjusted earnings per share of a dollar and 22 cents when you take a look at some of these subscriber numbers they added a net 100,000 mobile phone subscribers during the quarter that blew past the streets estimates of just below 70,000 that gain being led by uh, the additions that we saw in its business group the consumer group on the other hand lost 51,000 mobile customers easing the decline that we did see from the previous quarter. But all in all, we're looking at the streets reaction with shares up just about nearly 7% initially on this beat, the better than expected results that we got. And also how this positions Verizon amongst AT&T, T-Mobile, the other large players within yeah. the space. It's going to be a big question of what this company has to say as well to perhaps assuage any fears that may still persist among investors who are looking at this year over year slippage that, that took place and particularly and, and you had alluded to this a moment ago that total of Verizon consumer revenue down 2.3 percent year over year but they did see growth in service and other revenue offset by wireless equipment revenue declines here so all in when you're thinking about how this company is going to be able to bring on more consumers it's not just going to be on the the flashy devices but I think for a cautious or a conscious consumer who's cautious about how much they're incrementally spending, how much more they're spending on some of their plans for just connectivity for whether it's wireless service or for some of that in-home internet and broadband service as well. That's where even in a discretionary environment where there are necessities versus that connectivity, uh, well, necessity of connectivity, of, of course, but then some of the more discretionary purchases. This is a, an extremely staple service and a necessity in so many households, but even as the necessities get even more of kind of that stringent look across the household balance sheets, that's where a company in Verizon and some of the other telecom services, you could watch to see what that relationship looks like with the consumers and how the pricing strategy also perhaps gets um, a little bit more of a revision here to make sure that there isn't as much churn um, and churn going to be a big topic of, of focus here, I imagine, within the uh, call taking place today here too.
Yeah, and all that has been pressuring uh, Verizon shares since the start of the year. The yeah. stock was off just about 20% going into this report, so some excitement, at least today, on the heels of these results, but certainly uh, larger headwinds still remain. All right, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be right back. All right, General Motors out with better than expected earnings, but really all eyes remain uh, on how the business is doing, given what we are seeing with the UAW strike, of course, not, get, not only against General Motors, but against all of the big big three automakers. Joining us now is General Motors CFL, Paul Jacobson. And Paul, you know, good to see you as always, and, and thank you for making time for us during these very busy times. And the strange thing is, you actually had a good quarter. What do you see in terms of demand before we get into the strike? Well, thank you, Brian. First of all, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here and share the success and the results of the entire GM team and what we were able to do. You know, the vehicles that we're producing are the best in our history, uh, and customers are continuing to respond well to them. So it was a really strong quarter for us, uh, notwithstanding the impacts of the strike, uh, which uh, did hit our quarter by about $200 million um, from the early days of the strike. And, you know, we estimate that so far in the fourth quarter, it's been about $600 million through yesterday. What other, there's a lot to get into this. I almost don't even know where to begin, but what other financial levers do you need to pull as the CFO of GM to further weather an uncertain just backdrop or uncertainty on how long this strike goes? Well, I think, you know, whether it's labor or it's the uh, the macro economy, the consumer, uh, we've been preparing and, and making sure that we try to get ahead of um, uh, cost increases and, and any downturns as quickly as possible. So earlier this year, we announced a $2 billion cost reduction program. Uh, we're well into that. We actually added another billion dollars to that uh, to bring our total cost down by $2 billion net of depreciation in 2024. Um, so we saw some of these headwinds coming and uh, we've been working proactively to do that. You know, one of the other things that we've done and, and what we've announced today is, uh, or last week, was the um, uh, delay of the uh, Orion um, uh, truck plant too. Um, you know, we've seen a little bit of a slowdown in the rate of growth of EV adoption. Uh, RV, our EVs are still uh, selling very, very well in, in, in small quantities that we're producing right now. Um, but we saw this as an opportunity to, uh, to delay that a little bit, save some capital. Uh, it'll save about $1.5 billion in capital next year, but also given us an opportunity to uh, look at engineering improvements that we've seen through the process that are going to ultimately improve the profitability of that vehicle when it's produced in 2025. So really looking at all corners of the company uh, to try to find savings and, and a way to you know keep the momentum going. 
You know, you see how Mary Barra in her Cheryl letter, Paul, said something very interesting in my view. You know, there she said there she's interested in, in, in an offer that does not, just quote, does not put our company uh, and their jobs, the UAW jobs at risk. Is what the UAW continues to demand, it, is, would that put the company at risk? Well, you know, we, I'm not, I, w- I don't want to get into specifics. We'll leave that at the bargaining table. But I think what we've said from the beginning is, you know, our, our employees produce the best vehicles in the world and should be rewarded for that. And uh, we put an offer on the table that, that does that. And importantly, it allows us to compete uh, in, the, uh, in the new sector. When we look at EVs, when we look at foreign competition, um, that's something that we've got to look out for, for the long-term benefits of not just uh, the employees here, but the employees of tomorrow as well. Do you think, from your perch, Paul, that uh, UAW Chief Sean Fain has an end game in mind here? Uh, look, I've been watching his updates every Friday. I see him wearing T-shirts and saying, eat the rich. I see someone that is just enjoying this moment to the fullest. Uh, what is his exit? Uh, when does he come to the table here and meet you some way, toss you an olive branch? Do you even see that happening? Well, you know, we've had many productive conversations at the table, and you know, I would say that we've made um, we've made consider- considerable progress, uh, and we've we've got to get to a point where we close the deal and get get people back to work. But you know, I think the uh, the, the tactics and the strategy of the UAW um, have uh, you know caused us to withdraw our guidance for the full year. Uh, that's predominantly just based on the uncertainty and the scope and the duration of what the work stoppage is, and we don't want to speculate on how long that might be. Um, clearly we're at the table and we want to get people back to work uh, as quickly as possible. You know, the underlying business is performing well. Um, Before we took this action, you know, absent the strike, we would have been performing at the top half of our our guided range. Um, So the business continues to perform, but it does present some uncertainty that we thought the prudent thing to do was to withdraw that guidance uh, until we have more clarity as to um, um, the end of uh, the labor stoppage. And apologies in advance. I believe you recently took out a new line of liquidity, maybe around a, a month ago. Are, are you taking? Are you looking to take further steps now, under the assumption this could extend for or into early next year? Well, we've got an incredibly strong liquidity position, and we've got to make sure that we're prudent uh, to be able to protect the pace of investment uh, that we're making, uh, even in the event of a prolonged work stoppage. So, when you look at uh, when you look at the steps that we've done, we've taken some steps on cost austerity uh, in the short run in order to uh, uh, to make sure that we create the strongest foundation possible. Again, we don't we don't want this to go on a long time. We'd like to get people back to work, um, but we understand the situation, and uh, we need to be prepared for it. I think a lot of investors in GM and the automakers, Paul, haven't haven't lived through a situation like this. They have not seen a strike of, of this magnitude and, and the vitriol uh, that, that is playing out on social media. What type of longer term damage do you think this has to the auto industry? Well, you know, I do think that this is something that, um, you know, when we can get past this and when we can um, uh, prove to the market that, um, you know, we could rise to the challenges of what the uh, the higher costs are going to be uh, while still hitting our goals uh, and our targets uh, that we've we've set out for investors. Um, you know, I think we can recover some of that, but it is going to take some work. Uh, there, there's no doubt this is going to create some inflationary pressure, and uh, we're going to do our best to make sure that it doesn't disrupt us from our targets. But that requires us signing a deal that we know we can be competitive with um, in the future. And like I said, for the next generation. The latest offer that General Motors put forward, does that allow you to make money on electric vehicles? You know, it, it, it's going to take some work, um, but, uh, you know, we, we've got a team that is incredibly innovative and uh, one that uh, we've shown a lot of tactical resilience over the last couple of years, whether it be chip shortages, supply chain disruptions, COVID, et cetera. So, you know, I know we'll be able to find solutions to help mitigate that, um, but that's, that's what's important to make sure that, uh, you know, whatever contract we sign is one that we can uh, make sure that we can compete in the marketplace. You mentioned uh, just slowing um, some slowing demand for for EVs, and it's something we heard about from uh, Tesla too, and, and Elon Musk on his earnings call. Would you attribute that to, to higher interest rates? Um, I don't know that it's higher interest rates or it's you know the vehicles that are out in the market. When you look at um, the vehicles that we're producing um, on the Altium platform, um, they are purpose-built EVs. So uh, in terms of range, um, functionality, capabilities, um, they, we believe they're meeting customers' needs. A lot of the vehicles that are out there right now are, are vehicles that were um, put together, rushed to market, may not have the same capabilities. So while we're producing in limited quantities, and, and it's certain 
certainly growing. You know, we had 2x um, the Altium deliveries in 3Q that we did in 2Q. Um, we're, we're moving rapidly towards that. Um, we know that customers love them, uh, and uh, we're in the process of scaling that business up. So we feel good about the demand for our vehicles, but there's no doubt that there's a little bit of a slowness. Now, you know, I, I don't think that EV adoption um, uh, across the board is going to be a smooth line. I think it's going to be something that's choppy. And that's why we have such a great hand to play, because we've got a, a really strong ICE franchise uh, that is uh, that is doing tremendous things. And the products that we're uh, putting out are, are are better. Customers love them. Uh, and, uh, and they're um, contributing higher margins as well. So the ICE franchise is doing cr- incredibly well, and we've built a lot of flex in the system to make sure that we can respond to changes in the demand set. All right, we'll leave it there. General Motors CFO Paul Jacobson, thank you for giving us time. Again, I, I know these are very busy times, uncertain times. So we appreciate you making time for Yahoo Finance. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And our thanks to Brian Sazi for that interview. Coming up on the other side of this short break, we've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Welcome back, everyone. We're live from the NASDAQ market side. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. House Republicans are currently in a closed-door vote to select their new speaker designate. Lawmakers have their pick of eight names and will whittle down the pool until someone earns a majority in the room. A final vote on the House floor could happen as soon as later today. Joining us now with more on what is at stake here is Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Rick, it feels like we know all too well what is at stake. So what is this conversation going to entail? How's it going to be different than others past? It may not be any different. Uh, So, you know, the different um, cliches going around to describe this Groundhog Day. Here we go again. Uh, This is Republicans Plan D because they've already asked three speakers or three speaker candidates. So now they're on to number four. We could go to Plan E, Plan F. Uh, let's, Let's remind everybody that the vote today uh, is not for the sp- for the speaker pr- exactly. It's to be it's to nominate a speaker and figure out which of those eight Republicans or who knows maybe somebody else actually is the one who gets to have a vote. But there are problems with all of those, and you, everybody should be familiar with the math by now. That's to say, everybody who hasn't just fallen asleep at this boring drama. Um, the you know the, whoever is the nominee can only afford to lose for uh, Republican votes, and the Republican Party is just fractured in a way that makes it seem like there may be nobody who can get 
all but four or all but three Republican votes. So um, the analysis I'm following suggests that the it's in increasingly likely that the real outcome here is we have uh, a permanent speaker pro tem, in other words, no speaker uh, in the House, at least for a couple of months while we get those spending bills passed. But hey, here we go. Let's go through. Let's go through the process all over again and see if any of these guys uh, can at least get to the floor for an up or down vote. Rick, do you think the signals to us anything about maybe what to expect for 2024 for the pres presidential election? You're looking at a House cannot even get the GOP members of the House, can't get consensus on who they think should be elected speaker. The division that that then points to, obviously, within the party. Any implications you think from that on what how 2024 could potentially play out? Yes, and especially if you pair it with Donald Trump becomes the nominee. So you just if, if that were the case, you would have, uh, you know, Democrats could make the case that the Republican Re Republican Party is just a chaos machine from the top to the bottom. Trump, of course, facing four criminal uh, criminal state charges, including 91 separate uh, charges. Um, but I think we should also keep in mind that most Americans are not paying close attention to what's happening in the House. I mean, uh, for all the talk of how important it is to have a functioning government, nothing bad has happened so far. Um, it could happen if we, you know, we only have three weeks until those temporary spending bills expire. We've got this important legislation out there for funding Israel and Ukraine and some other things. Um, so if it gets to the point that like the country actually starts to kind of fall apart because Republicans can't pull it together in the House, that's one thing. So, you know, it, a year from now in the 2024 general elections, most people are not going to be voting based on what they remember about the uh, chaos of the Republicans trying to elect a House speaker. But if this continues um, and the whole party looks like a cauldron of chaos uh, yes, it could help the Democrats, and you are absolutely going to see the Biden campaign and the campaign of other Democrats trying to exploit that through ads and other things. All right, Rick Newman, as always, thanks so much for giving us the latest on that down in D.C., the chaos that seems to unfold right now on a daily basis. Bye, guys. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be right back. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there is more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light and space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
I'm Brett Smith alongside Shauna Smith here at the NASDAQ in New York City. And we are about 30 minutes into the start of the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up on this Tuesday. Stocks, they're higher right now as yields drop from their highs. The focus for the remainder of the week remains heavily on the tech giants. The S&P 500 is up by about 7 tenths of a percent since the opening bell. Let's take a look at some of the individual movers this morning. Shares of Halliburton falling on its third quarter results. Now profit jumped 32% on higher international drilling and equipment demand. But revenue did come up a bit short of the street's expectations. And we are also watching shares of 3M. That stock is moving higher after the industrial company posted its second consecutive big earnings beat. The company boosted its full year profit outlook as a way to cut costs and offset weak sales. And Logitech shares are jumping after the company lifted its full year guidance. Now the Swiss maker of computer keyboards and webcams saw consumer spending more on its accessories. The company also boosting its profits by cutting costs and pulling back on spending for logistics and for promotions. You're looking at gains here of just about 12 and percent. Let's give you the market commentary of the day, and it's the latest that we're hearing from executives. They're feeling, feeling a bit more pessimistic about where the economy is heading. We've got some fresh commentary out of a conference in Saudi Arabia, down, out of Riyadh here today. Now, Bridgewater Associates founder Ray Dalio saying, quote, if you take the time horizon, the monetary policies that we are going to see will have greater effects on the world. It's difficult to be optimistic about that. We also from Citigroup CEO Jane Fraser echoing the similar tone here, saying that she believes, quote, we're sitting here with the backdrop of the terrorist attack in Israel and the events that have unfolded since, and it's desperately sad. So it's hard not to be a little pessimistic at this point. A very similar tone when you take a look at pretty much most of the commentary that we're getting there from the conference. BlackRock's Larry Fink saying that the wars in Israel and in Ukraine, if they're not resolved, it will lead to far greater uh, fear and insecurity, less hope in society. When there's less hope, we see contractions in our economies. Goldman's uh, David Solomon was warning just about the uncertain market right now for M&A and where exactly that is headed. And then Jamie Dimon also brought up the fact about the forecasting here from c central banks, from the Fed, has been so wrong over the last 18 months that that could then lead to some humility when we're taking into account the outlook here for next year. But Diamond's saying that he is cautious about what is going to happen when you look ahead to 2024. So I think it's a number of factors. We just mentioned the escalating tensions in the Middle East. We know, obviously, Fed policy as well. And then you also have the elections here in yes. the U.S., how exactly that could shape policy going forward, certainly clouding, I think, the outlook for many of these top leaders. Yeah, I think you did an excellent job of laying out what's taking place at Davos in the desert, as they call it. But Ultimately here, the, the tone, as many executives have noted, as you were mentioning, in, and they are apt to really note what's taking place internationally, what the conflict is, and cite that and, and name it while they are there. But also, I think there's something larger, too, that they also have to remember and consider here. I mean, they're sitting in an area where Saudi Arabia and, and Russia, they've already extended voluntary oil cuts until the end of the year here. And that is another inflationary pressure that all of these economists, bank CEOs, people who are speaking and monitoring where those oil prices are also putting pressure on the inflationary picture internationally, where that continues to need to come up in conversation and where there is uh, at least a furthering of where some of that can abate in the future. Um, but that is, I think, another kind of outlier discussion that needs to take place and perhaps one where we'll get a little bit more color <laughs> either coming after or perhaps while uh, things are continuing to go on in that Davos and the desert meeting. But there was, of course, question mark for a lot of these executives as of whether or not they would actually even go. For those yeah. that have showed up, we'll see what they see as the kind of return on investment of their time while there too. Yeah, there was lots of questions just about what attendance was going to look yeah. like, at least in terms of what we have heard uh, as of late. It doesn't seem like there were many cancellations uh, lately, given the fact of the escalating tensions that's happening right now in the Middle East following Hamas's attack on Israel. But when you take into account also just what they're saying more broadly speaking, right, about mm -hmm. geopolitical yeah. uh, policy right now, geopolitical tensions, how exactly that could weigh on the economy. Obviously, it's always been an issue clearly, but really that has been brought in the forefront here over the last couple of weeks, given right. the fact that obviously also how it's playing out down in Washington too. We have we don't have a Speaker of the House, the House not able to approve uh, potentially more aid going towards Israel, going towards Ukraine. 
So certainly a number of factors that these business leaders are pointing out over in Saudi Arabia, just about what are the potential drivers for the market, for the broader economy here going forward. Right. And three big impacts, just as we end this conversation, too. Number one, we talked about the commodities impact mm -hmm. and that potential there on oil. But then additionally, you think about what consumer sentiment, especially if coming out of this meeting and you see more of a, a deglobalization that transpires even further, that's another risk. But then also here for all of these businesses and for the CEOs that have continued to cite geopolitical tensions as some of their top concerns, at least over the course of this year and how that permeates into next year, it's also going to have a larger implication as of who is the next CEO of the United States and what their policy will be. And that could take us back to the entire tariff conversation too, which is another headwind pressure that many of these business CEOs would need to think about as well here. Uh, so all of that continuing to be monitored. We're also continuing to monitor some volatile moves moves in the bond market over the last week. Large moves on the 10-year. They have pushed yields closer to uninverting, but that might not be a good sign for the economic outlook. Yahoo Finance's markets reporter Josh Schaefer is here with a closer look at the recession indicator. Hey, Josh. Yeah, Brad. So I spoke with the founder of the recession indicator last night, Professor Campbell Harvey, and I asked him, you know, what happens when these yields uninvert? You remember back since last November, we've been talking about the inverted yield curve, meaning that yields on the three month on the three month treasury have actually gone below what we see on or sorry higher than what we see on the 10 year treasury so that's been inverted that yield curve but what happens when we uninvert so if you look right now at the inverted yield curve right now we, we're showing you the 10 and the two year and you can see that it's getting closer and closer to uninverting at the end of your screen on your right there but what's interesting here is what's happened before the last four recessions those gray vertical lines we have on our chart here before the last four recessions, we've actually seen the yield curve uninvert. So what happens when it uninverts, and the key to understand here that Professor Harvey was talking to me about is why it uninverts and why we're seeing the yield curve potentially uninvert now or in the coming weeks, it is not uninverted yet, would be the move in the long rates. We've seen a big move in the 10-year yield. What they call this is a bear steepening. And what, we, what we're talking about with that, of course, bear and bull, bear not normally good for stock investors, right? And Professor Harvey gave me basically three specific reasons why the bear steepening and that rise in long rates is not good. So for one, it's the most closely related rates to consumers and businesses. So it impacts both consumers and businesses because when we're talking about long rates, we're talking about 10s, 20s, 30 years. Well, what's the most common 30-year 30 year rate we think of, we think of a mortgage rate, right? That highly impacts consumers. It's also gonna cost more for businesses to get loans when they come back to market over the next couple of years. That will shrink their profits. If their profits shrink, they might have more layoffs. So that's something to think about. And then again, the long-term lagging impacts is something we keep talking about with these yields. When we think about long rates and those being long rated interest rates that people are taking loans out on, Professor Harvey was very harp, kept harping on the fact that that's gonna be something that we don't see necessarily right now, but something that we're going to see coming down the pike. That's what actually has him in the camp of he thinks the central bank should be talking more about rate cuts right now than rate hikes, which also stuck out to me. All right, Josh, uh, great job analyzing all of that and really drilling down to exactly what this could mean here, not only for the broader economy, but also for our viewers, for our consumers. So thanks so much, Josh, for that. We want to dig a little bit deeper about the movement that we have seen in rates, the rise in Treasury yields most recently, and getting a to the latest on this rate debate. Has the sell-off in bonds gone too far or is higher for longer here to say? Now, against this backdrop, investors are bracing for key data to shed light on the strength of the U.S. economy, we also want to know whether or not fears of a recession is going to be enough to steer the Fed away from future hikes. To break all of this down, we want to bring in Blake Gwynn. He's the RBC Capital Markets Head of Rate Strategy to weigh in on all of this. Blake, it's great to see you. So we just heard uh, from our reporter, Josh Schaefer, just about an uninverted yield curve, what exactly that could signal. I'm curious to get your perspective on the implications of that and exactly what you're watching or expecting as we do see that scenario potentially play out. Yeah, I thought he did a great summary, by the way, um, on kind of what's driving it. And I think the differences between the steepening that we're seeing now and the steepening that you typically see into those recessions, because that is, um, we usually see those pivots to a steepener environment uh, in a bullish environment where the market is starting to anticipate and price in cuts that are coming from the Federal Reserve. And here, what we've seen over the last 
a uh, month and a half, basically back to, to late July, is actually something that's much, much different. It's long end rates rising uh, while the front end is, is relatively steady. And I think that uh, for, for most of that move has really been um, about supply and demand. I think that's one of the factors that comes up the most. Uh, when the back end tends to go up and the front end is remaining uh, steady, we tend to think of that, um, you, you'll hear people refer to term premium. That basically just means any move in yields, it's not really directly related to the near-term Fed expectations. Um, it's kind of interesting to say that because with all the focus on the Fed uh, and this kind of higher for longer, a big piece of the rate move we've seen has actually not been about a repricing of Fed expectations. Um, some of it has come with the market pricing out cuts, but we haven't really, um, you know, we haven't really revisited the idea of terminal. It's not like the terminal rate is continuing to move higher. That's what we saw through, uh, you know, most of the beginning of this year into 2020, uh, back to 2022. Um, this is really more about these kind of long-term rates and the term premium, not about the near-term Fed pricing. I think a lot of that has to do with supply and demand outlook. There's a lot of treasury supply coming, deficits of surprise to the upside. There's a lot of concerns about who's going to buy all that treasury debt. Um, and I think that's um, led a lot of people to think that this you know, term premium driven move uh, can continue uh, as that supply continues to come online and markets just struggle to absorb it. You know, and Blake, even as we think about the expectations going into the next Fed meeting, too, and how this could continue to impact yields, much of the anticipation, at least from the CME Fed Watch tool, is that there's going to be no change, that there's going to be no decision that would ultimately kind of move rates higher at this next meeting. So how does that cal calculate into the yield move that we're watching right now? Well, well, two things. So let me just tell you kind of where I'm at on the Fed. I agree with what's basically priced in the markets, that they're going to pause in November. I think the Fed speak we've seen over the last few weeks heading into the blackout period ahead of this shows a Fed that is very reluctant to continue rising rates. Um, you know, we just heard a lot of discussion about, um, you know, what higher rates, higher term premium can mean for consumers, for borrowers. And I think the concern that you're seeing from Fed members is that they are looking at these higher rates and thinking, hey, this is doing some of our work for us. We don't need to continue hiking rates if, if longer term rates are moving up and you know, these mortgage costs and other ways that it impacts the, um, you know, the economy. If those are starting to get tighter and those financial conditions are tightening on their own, uh, we need to do less. So I think you've seen that kind of vibe um, from the Fed speakers over the last two weeks where they, they seem like the bar to, to continue hiking is very high. Um, as far as what that means for these moves continuing, um, you know, I think with a Fed on hold and not wanting to hike more, you do take, take away some of the upside risk to front end yields. But I think what's interesting is after Powell, we actually saw curves continue to bear steepen after he delivered what I think was widely viewed as a, a dovish message. Typically, when you get dovish Fed speak, um, you actually see a bull steepening because uh, people start to price out those front end, uh, you know, additional Fed hikes. They start to price in additional cuts. Um, but this time we saw a, a bear steepening. And I think that's because when you couple the strong data that we've had with a Fed that seems very resolute to not hike again, um, that starts to add some upside risk to long term growth and inflation. And that manifests itself through higher back end yields, through higher term premium, through a steeper curve. So um, so I do think with the Fed on hold, if the data continues to be strong, as we saw with NFP, CPI, retail sales, if that kind of strength of the data continues and the Fed still says, hey, we're not moving, it's possible that this term premium move could continue, except now it's more about upside risk, inflation growth than it is supply and demand for Treasury securities. Well, please. When we talk about the supply and demand issues, though, and the, the Fed's role or diminished role potentially here in all of this, how do you see that? How much of that is playing into the volatility expectations that we could see play out within within treasuries, within yields over the coming months? I mean, when, when we're trying to figure out, I guess, the biggest drivers here, how should investors be looking at that? So, I, I mean, I think, it, you know, if we're referring to the Fed's balance sheet policy, QT obviously puts pressure on Treasury. They have to fund that whole. So every month when, um, you know, the Fed is allowing these securities to roll off its balance sheet, that does create a funding need for Treasury. Um, and I think what really kicked off a lot of these supply and demand concerns uh, is that the last refunding announcement that we had from Treasury, which was back at the very beginning of August, um, they surprised a lot of people with how large they were forecasting the deficit. Um, I forecast this stuff very closely, and I know a lot of other people who watch this very closely, were, were surprised by by the deficits they put out. And that caps off, I think, almost a year where every single quarter, it seems, deficit expectations, issuance ex expectations have continued to go higher. Now, a piece of that's related to QT, it's related to Fed balance sheet policy, but there's also a lot of it that's related to the fact that rates have just gone higher, meaning you know the amount they have to pay on Treasury debt goes higher, uh, cost of living uh, 
adjustments to Social Security payments, a lot of other reasons why those deficits have continued to go up. But I think from here, I feel like the risks are a lot more two way. I think we've basically caught up. Um, we, meaning the street investors, have caught up with where we're expecting those deficits and uh, you know where the supply is, is supposed to be. And even though it's going to continue to come online, I think we at least now kind of know we're, we're all on the right side of where those deficit expectations need to be going forward. So I think we have less volatility coming from the supply and demand channel um, than you know, maybe this, this kind of upside risk to long-term growth and inflation, as I was mentioning before. Interesting. Want to uh, digest there. Blake Gwynn, always great to get your perspective. RBC Capital Markets, head of rate strategy. Thanks so much. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Taylor Swift making music history today, announcing she's going back on tour after a five-year break. Pre-sales for her upcoming tour kicked off yesterday, but a surge in demand caused Ticketmaster's website to freeze or even crash altogether. There's so much fanfare in, around the summer that has been Taylor Swift. The Philadelphia Federal Reserve mentioned the impact that her tour had on the economy. Jersey sales for Travis Kelsey up 400% is podcasting number one on the Apple charts, all because of Taylor. Yeah. Taylor Swift for Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift for Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift is breaking the internet again. Almost one year ago, singer-songwriter Taylor Swift began a journey that would change the American economy as we know it, starting with ticket sales for the Eras Tour. Over three and a half million people signed up for Ticketmaster's verified fan presale, but only 2.4 million tickets were ultimately sold. The unprecedented demand created a frenzy that resulted in a congressional hearing against the ticketing company, all while solidifying Swift's status as the world's biggest pop star. The tour kicked off in March of 2023 and has since blown up headlines and even landed in Philly's Fed report. Analysts expect the tour to pass the $1 billion mark during its international leg in March of 2024. That would be Elton John's nearly $940 million record for his farewell tour, which concluded in July. Swift's Eras tour is also expected to generate as much as $5 billion in consumer spending in the US. People are dropping money on plane and hotel tickets, fun outfits and merch, $75 hoodies, $55 long sleeve shirts. And we didn't even talk about ticket prices with resale picks selling between $500 to $7,000 a pop. And in some cases, even higher. And that economic impact has only grown beyond the tour with Swift now rumored to be dating Chiefs tight end, Travis Kelsey. Ticketing platform StubHub reported a 175% increase in ticket sales after she attended one of his games. And according to fan merchandise company Fanatics, Kelsey's jersey sales have increased by 400% since that first Swift appearance. And now her team is taking it one step further by releasing a big screen adaption of her popular Eras form. Bottom line, the Taylor Swift economy isn't going out of style anytime soon.
Higher mortgage rates and low inventory are some of the big challenges that have been facing the housing market this year, stalling much of the activity really that we have seen over the last several years. Well, now Goldman Sachs is out with its outlook for next year for 2024, and they're warning of more pain ahead. We want to bring in David Maracle. He is at Goldman Sachs, chief economist in global investment research. It's great to see you here, David. So let's talk about the dynamics at play right now in housing, how you see that reshaping, or if at all, the housing market next next year do you see any signs of improvement on the horizon um probably not in terms of either home prices or home sales um home building has actually proven surprisingly resilient this cycle to mortgage rates that would have seemed awfully high back in 2019. So i think we we kind of need to separate the two things out on the home sales side of things most americans now have mortgages at rates that are well below current market rates. So understandably, people are reluctant to move because they'll wind up with a much higher mortgage. And so home sales have fallen quite a bit. We expect those to stay quite low next year. Home building did come down a lot in 2022 as the Fed signaled a hiking cycle. Uh, and I certainly think there will be some consequences of the renewed rise in interest rates. I would just say, you know, relative to what you would have normally expected historically, from an increase in mortgage rates of this magnitude. The impact this time around has been diminished by the fact that we have a serious national single family housing shortage. Uh, this was something that, you know, at the outset of the rate hike cycle, we thought it was probably going to limit the impact. Again, not that there's been no impact. Home building activity did come down last year, uh, but it's still comparable to where it was prior to the pandemic. And that's because if supply is the binding constraint on economic activity, then even bringing demand down a lot by discouraging some fraction of potential buyers from buying at these higher mortgage rates uh, still leaves plenty of buyers in the market uh, and still doesn't affect prices all that much, which means for home builders, if you can build a home and turn it around and sell it, uh, that's still pretty attractive. So we're looking for home building to be roughly flat next year, home sales to remain at a, at a quite depressed level. Yeah, we were speaking about this just a few days ago and looking across the backlogs that many of the home builders still have that they're working through and, and where some of those new orders are continuing to flow in, even if it is decelerating. One of the things that we are continuing to monitor as well is where, where potentially there needs to be more decline. And, and I would love to know from your purview where the prices need to decline further for a lot of home buyers and prospective home buyers out there to feel like they can effectively offset where rates may be at right now. Uh, well, I think prices are unlikely to decline meaningfully precisely because of the, the supply shortage. I would distinguish a little bit between the single family market and the multifamily market. On the single family side, by most estimates, we have a shortage of many millions of homes because we've made it somewhat difficult to build in many places that people want to live in this country uh, with zoning restrictions and things like that. The multifamily supply response to high prices, though, over the couple last couple of years has been much more forceful. And indeed, we've seen uh, a lot of completion of multifamily units, and we have a huge number of multifamily units that are still in the pipeline that builders want to want to finish up. So we have made more of a supply impact on the rental market, and that has helped to slow growth uh, of rents. But it's just very difficult in a short period of time to have an equally appreciable impact on the single family market. And in fact, we've seen the homeowner vacancy rate fall uh, even a little bit further to now a historic low. So primarily for that reason, you're, you're absolutely right that affordability has diminished substantially. First, prices rose a lot, then mortgage rates rose a lot. It costs an awful lot more to finance owner-occupied housing uh, than it did several years ago. But because of the supply shortage, uh, I think the demand is still there for, you know, for the market to clear at prices similar to where we are. So we're looking for a small dip in prices in reaction to the big move in rates that we've seen this year, mm -hmm. but then a small uptick next year. So uh, no major changes from here. Yeah, David, we got to hustle to our finish here. But ultimately, when you think about the kind of turnover on a market basis because of the zoning that you were mentioning, are, are you expecting there to be another wave of perhaps migration into different markets where uh, affordability is that much more attainable for prospective home buyers? 
I think that's a that's a reasonable conclusion um, for people who don't have homes that you might see some migration toward uh, cheaper markets when people get to the stage of their life that they want to buy a home. For people who do own a home, who do have a mortgage in general, they're paying a much lower rate than is available today. So they're sort of locked in. But the, you know, the people who are renting, who want to transition to buying, given the high level of prices uh, and given the impediments to building more housing, uh, in areas where prices are very high, uh, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense that we'll continue to see migration toward lower housing cost areas. David, where do you see mortgage rates at the end of next year? Uh, similar, similar levels. You know, we don't have the Fed changing policy until Q4 of next year, uh, and you know, I think the increase in long-term interest rates that we've seen recently, which is of course spilled over to the mortgage market. Um, has probably come in, come from things that are likely to persist. You know, number one, I think the market has substantially reevaluated what it believed last cycle about the longer term neutral or equilibrium rate. Uh, and number two, possibly there's been some increase in term premia as well. Um, I, you know, until the Fed cuts or until something interest rate related seems to go wrong in the economy, uh, I don't see a lot of obvious reason to expect um, you know meaningful declines there. All right. Excellent work here. And, and thanks for bringing this to our attention here. Some of the work that you and the team over there are doing. David Merkel, who is Goldman Sachs chief economist in global investment research. We appreciate the time here today. Thank you. Thanks. Well, big tech earnings kick off today with Microsoft and Alphabet or Google or Alpha Google, whatever you're calling them at home. Just call them reporting after the bell. More on what to expect from the sector. Yahoo Finance's reporter Jared Blickery is here. Jared, call him what you want. Uh, Alpha Google, I love it. I'm going to roll with that. Uh, we got some big ones up this week. Uh, Apple's next week. We already did Tesla last week or the week before. NVIDIA is in a month, but we got some of these uh, four magnificent seven this week. You know, Citi had an interesting note. Uh, they reminded me that we've actually been in an earnings recession. That is, that is, we've had uh, several quarters back to back of year over year declines in S&P 500 earnings, um, but that could be coming to an end right now. That's because we're finally in flex up enough, up enough that we're actually going to have positive earnings this quarter, and we won't know that for sure in a few weeks. Uh, but a far cry from earlier in the year when a lot of people thought that earnings would be showing uh, terrible results and would be leading the general economy into a recession. Uh, that most notably has not happened. And here's a key quote from Citigroup. Uh, there is no doubt that 2024 recession risk, that's for next year, remains a U.S. equity market overhang. Our view continues to emphasize that earnings Earnings risk may be less than typical relative to prior recessions. Further, recessions usually lead to interest rate relief. This can set up for valuation support. And so what they're talking about there is the tendency of the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates into a recession. Now, the problem I would note there is that by the time people in the street go from realizing that it's a soft landing to a hard landing, that usually happens in an instant. Uh, that's when you get a non-farm payroll report that is just way out of uh, bounds, maybe negative on the headline payrolls growth. That's when you see weekly jobless claims spiking up to 400, 500,000. That happens very quickly, but we haven't seen that yet. And that's because the consumer is spending and companies, while they're hoarding laborers, they're able to pass on their increased costs to the consumer. And so until that is disrupted, uh, we don't get that recession. However, like I just said, when we do finally get that, uh, probably going to be an uh, up and coming day for stock investors because that repricing typically hits uh, stocks the most. That's when the Fed suddenly has to cut 100 basis points, 200 basis points at a time. That's when you see the uh, global, that's what you saw during the global financial crisis. That's what you saw in the year 2000. Now, if we're playing out 1994, 95, if we're playing out 1998, uh, maybe the Fed does engineer a soft landing, but remains to be seen. Back to the main point, got to talk about some earnings here. Uh, Magnificent Seven, just wanted to point out that 30% of the S&P 500's market cap, and this goes back 10 years, is in the Magnificent Seven, starting from less than 10% 10 years ago. So this is a huge amount. Just to remind everybody uh, that these guys have been trading much higher. This is a P.E. ratio of the Magnificent Seven here, up almost to the 50 level. Here is the S&P uh, 493 right down here. It really is a bifurcated market. We have Dan Howley coming up. He's going to tell you some more about what to expect out of the earnings. Uh, but I did want to chart some of the price action, just some really long-term things that have kind of 
of caught my eye here. I'm going to pull up Microsoft, first of all. Let's look at a three-year chart. This is almost a, a very long-term cup and handle or a cup and flag, if you will, a very bullish chart formation, but it takes a long time for these things to play out. If we were to see a spike above these recent highs there, that could mean the next leg is up coming for uh, Microsoft. Uh, if we go to the downside, I'd watch 320, 315 as a potential support level. And then Alphabet, pretty similar chart here. Haven't gotten quite back up to these highs, but could have a cup formation in the making. Um, also going to take a look at Amazon here. It's been trading a little bit differently, uh, still in the bottom half of its three-year range there, but nevertheless, lots of uh, things to look forward to and to be excited about in these earnings announcements. We're going to bring those to you after the bell today, tomorrow, and Thursday as well, guys. That's about six hours from now, right? Jared Blickery, yes. thanks so much. Keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be right back. Holiday shopping season is right around the corner, but after a less than stellar public debut for Birkenstock and also current macroeconomic headwinds shaking up the industry, will consumers pull back on spending this holiday season? Our next guest says that higher interest rates and also rising credit card debt may catch up to the so far resilient consumer. Zachary Waring, he's a CFRA analyst, joining us now. Zachary, it's good to have you here. So I think a lot of retailers are trying to figure out exactly what the holiday season is going to look like. How do you see it shaping up? Yeah, so the way we're looking at it this year is it's not quite, um, you know, a collapse of retail sales. We just think there's a lot of different headwinds piling up against the consumer. So obviously you've, you've stated them. Um, and, you know, we think that those will probably lead to flat to down sales for apparel and footwear. Okay, and so for apparel and footwear and where consumers are going to be looking for discounts and the retailers that that could potentially impact the most, which ones are perhaps the most at risk in that effort? Yeah, so um, a couple of economists and analysts have come out and said, you know, they think that low to middle income consumers are kind of spent through that excess savings that they build up since the pandemic, uh, while high income consumers still have um, a significant chunk of that left. Um, so we like companies that cater to high income consumers and we like companies that may benefit from a trade down from the middle income consumer. Um, companies like Ross and TJ Maxx and then we like Lululemon as kind of a, a high income consumer brand. 
When you talk about some of the areas, we, we mentioned the credit card delinquencies, we mentioned the fact that we have higher rates. When we talk about the shift that you expect to see in the consumer, what are some of the other factors that you think are going to be driving consumers to pull back on some of those spending plans? Yeah, so I mean, I think the last few years, the consumer obviously had a lot of money, so there's a, a little bit of pull forward demand. Um, so, you know, a lot of consumers bought more shoes and, and clothes than they needed, probably. Um, so I think that's probably going to be one of the things that's a headwind. Obviously, you've seen that growth decelerate uh, in the first eight months of this year. Um, you know, I think under 2% growth for retail in general and then under 2% for apparel and footwear um, and, you know, clothing and clothing accessory stores. So, um, you know, we expect it to just kind of continue along that slow decline. Um we, like we said, we don't think it's, you know, Armageddon here. We just think, you know, maybe flat to down off of two really successful years in 2021 and 2022. And so going into 2024, where do you expect that consumer sentiments to ultimately net out? Are we looking at and thinking about a consumer that is going to continue some of perhaps the the retail therapy that, that typically takes place in some pockets where they're buying into like little luxuries here and there? Or is this consumer that is gonna continue buying into experiences and says, you know what, for the goods, I'm, I'm all set, I'm good. Yeah, I mean, I think early, that'll probably be the, the, the strategy, obviously. Um, services and entertainment has done really well uh, the last two years because of the pull forward demand that we saw during the pandemic. Um, I just I don't think that's going to change immediately here. Um, the consumer doesn't have a lot to be excited about. Obviously, um, they do have wages up um, and it's a, lo a very low unemployment rate. So that's obviously good for the consumer and these apparel and footwear retailers. But, um, you know, we just think over the next 12 months, it'll probably just be a slow grind. Um, we don't think anything's going to break and that, you know, the economy is going to go into a deep recession, but we do, th we do see a slowdown deceleration. Zachary, how do you see the spending breaking down when we talk about online sales versus brick and mortar in store uh, shopping? How do you see that activity? I guess, where do you see shoppers spending this holiday season? But then also in terms of that shift that we clearly did see towards online e-commerce sales during the pandemic, how sticky do you think some of that shopping pattern, shopping behavior is? Yeah, so non-store or like you said, e-commerce retailers, you know, actually held up better than we thought last year. Um, you know, we thought once people were able to get back out and stop, start spending in stores that that would kind of maybe decline after a, a 2020 and 2021 where, you know, you saw ex extreme growth in the uh, e-commerce and non-store retail. Um, and it just didn't, uh, it continued its uptrend. I think it, you know, it was up high single digits last year, low double digits um, over the holidays. So, you know, we think that'll continue. We think that's kind of a long-term, you know, high single digit growth for non-store or e-commerce. And then Brick and mortar has just kind of been in a slow decline over the past 10 to 15 years. And we kind of see that trend playing out as well. Um, we think, you know, the last two years or the last year um, where people were able to get back out and shop, um, that was kind of a one off. Um, and that won't continue to, you know, you're not going to see 20 percent um, in store growth um, moving forward. So. Um, you know, we like non-store. We think that'll continue to grow. Um, and then brick and mortar is probably going to slow down and you're probably going to see um, a revert to trend. So back down to to stale growth or, or negative growth. Zach, I, I, you know, we've heard who, who gets you jazzed up right now with some of the companies who you included within the piece, Lululemon, even though I'm not buying, you know, regardless of the technical fabric, some of those $79 three pack of the briefs that are amazing. At the same time, I'm looking for a discount, waiting for them to come down a little bit more. It's my own chagrin, perhaps some of the other consumers who are viewing out there too. But at the end of the day, which company is just out of position right now? Because you mentioned on one side, Lululemon might be in a, a good position with some of the higher tier and then Ross with some of the mid or lower uh, who are looking for discounting and deals in TJX as well. But which which brands are just and retailers are just out of position from your perspective? Yeah, and I don't think it's an out of pers or, um, um, out of position uh, stance. I think it's just kind of, you know, these are cyclical companies. Obviously, when the consumer is healthy and, and spending a lot, they benefit. And then when they're not, 
um, you know, they don't do as well. And we just think, you know, your typical middle to low income consumer companies, you know, we, we don't like Under Armour or Gap. Um, you know, it's kind of a out of favor view, but we also don't really like Nike. Um, you know, we just upgraded to a hold recently on Nike. Uh, but we just think that they, you know, they target that consumer. They tar- they a lot of their business is done to low to middle income consumers. Um, and we just think there's going to be promotional activity this holiday season to fight for those dollars. Um, uh, the, you know, we just we don't like companies that cater to the middle to low income consumer. Wow, man, that hurts. I'm in there. Zach, <laughs> Zachary Warren, who is the CFRA analyst. Zach, appreciate the time here this morning. we got to talk about those records behind you next time you're on, because I see that whole collection as well. All right, well, we'll get Zachary back. We've got further action from the UAW strike here this morning with the union announcing 5,000 members. They have walked out of General Motors' Arlington Assembly Plant in Texas. This brings the total number on strike to over 45,000 across the three big automakers here, Ford, GM, and Stellantis. Let's take a look at those shares to see where that price action is percolating here on the day. For what we're seeing as of right now for GM stock here, it's down by, well, flat, just barely to the downside. That's after it was higher, just fractionally. Of course, this is the day where they also reported earnings. So this is a very, and what we're seeing play out from UAW, very knowledgeable of these reporting cadences, saying that it's really going to kind of reduce the expected cadence of when it's announcing these and just kind of going as they see fit and organizing in their own manner that is really catching, I think, some of the automakers on on their back foot or on their heels as they really announce more of these strikes. Uh, This one targeting Arlington, Texas and the plant there. Yeah, and taking a look at this release uh, from the UAW, Sean Fain saying that another record quarter, another record year. As we've said for months, record profits equal record contracts. It's time GM workers and the whole working class get their fair share. Again, this expansion of the strike announced after GM reported its results this morning, where the company said that the strike is already costing them $200 million per week. They withdrew their guidance just because, based in part on the unpredictability of the strike, how long it's going to last. Obviously, a massive headwind here for GM and just the broader uh, auto space as well here. When it comes to why, though, this plan is so important to point out. It's because it's one of GM's most profitable plants in terms of profitable vehicles, I should say. Produces some of GM's most profitable vehicles. It produces the Chevy Tahoe, the Yukon, the Escalade. So this is all noted within this release here from the UAW. So it could potentially have a massive Mm -hmm. hit on GM going forward when we talk about the fact that there is maybe a likelihood that these strikes could continue to expand in the coming weeks if we don't see any sort of resolution or any sort of uh, significant, uh, I guess, agreements be, start to happen between the union and these big three automakers. Yeah, and it's particularly interesting, especially as these negotiations play out. What we heard from the GM CFO, Paul Jacobson, who spoke with mm-hmm. our own executive editor, Brian Sazi, about where they're seeing demand not continue this acceleration, especially in that EV pickup that every automaker that we were just talking about has some type of ambition around or production target, sales target, delivering into the dealerships and ultimately looking at some of the names within their own family of models that have the most brand equity that they've decided to electrify. And so if you do see any slippage, at least in the uptick of people, households that are buying into those vehicles, then you're going to hear more of what you heard from CFO Paul Jacobson about where they're perhaps putting some of those plans, not on ice totally, but at least kind of decelerating how much they were planning to either spend or the amount of manufacturing that goes into them, especially while these negotiations play out. And these negotiations certainly are about the future of production for those electrified vehicles as well. And we certainly heard uh, GM rethinking its growth plans here for the EV space. So something we got to keep our eye on. Absolutely. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
them you got to hit spot. on the sneakers after a lot of people <laughs> for that. Investors gearing up for a big tech earnings with both Microsoft and Alphabet on tap after the bell today. But what are some key themes that you can expect? Yahoo Finance's tech editor Dan Howley joins us with the breakdown. They already said artificial intelligence. That was of quarters past, Dan. So what is it going to be this time around? Yeah, Brad, AI is still going to be a big part of this. I mean, it's it's got to be. This is where the companies are making massive investments. So it's going to be a, a huge part of the conversation. But I think there's other parts of this as well. So let's just break it down into, into categories. We have the AI aspect, but then there's the cloud aspect, which is almost inseparable from the AI aspect. You're seeing these companies develop AI because they want to improve their cloud infrastructure and get more consumers into their own businesses. Don't forget, you know, we talk about the cloud, we've talked about the cloud, but there's still tons of companies out there that are not in the cloud. So there's still that growth opportunity there for sure. And AI is seen as a kind of way to help goose those uh, revenues, especially with Microsoft uh, announcing that it was charging $30 per person uh, for that Microsoft 365 Copilot software for the enterprise. Uh, in addition to those, we're also looking at advertising. Yes, Microsoft has an advertising arm. It's part of its search and LinkedIn uh, portion. And so it brings in advertising there, but really Google is what uh, is the main player here when it comes to advertising. It's you know one of the largest advertising, digital advertising firms in the world outside of Meta or Facebook or whatever Mark Zuckerberg's calling it today. Uh, and so I think that's going to also play a big role in this. And so, you know, it's whether or not we're seeing uh, digital advertising return to what it was, uh, if we can see an uptick there, that's also going to inform potentially what we see from the likes of, of Meta, which again, is the, the number two ad digital advertising firm out there. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the, the advertising aspect goes beyond just Microsoft, Google, Meta. It also impacts Amazon, which has a growing advertising arm, uh, as well as Apple, which has a growing advertising arm uh, all of its own. So there's all of these companies that are doing uh, different parts of advertising. Uh, and so that's going to be a major piece for it. Dan, um, you know, that's great. And advertising is huge. However, they made this announcement for Meta about the Wayfair Ray-Bans, the Meta Wayfarers. Uh, are they going to give us any, any uh, indication about those, uh, how, how successful they expect them to be? If that's actually the, the immersive product that's going to get people into the metaverse in, in some facet or another? Well, look, I've, I've used them before. Uh, I used them at a preview. Have you? And, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually use the, the first generation as well. They look like regular sunglasses. Uh, I was going to bring them to a friend's wedding and then I just forgot them to, you know, give them a try this time around. But I think, you know, these are these are products that uh, are still relatively niche. Um, yet we don't know how much people actually want to slap stuff on their faces uh, with technology. Sure, we're, we're a lot more comfortable now with a product like that than we were uh, years ago when Google Glass came out and the idea of someone having a camera on their face and recording you everywhere you went was considered creepy. Now, I mean, you know, you walk across, you know, the city and uh, we're in New York here, everybody's got their cell phone up recording everything. Um, and so, you know, it's less of a creepy factor, uh, but, you know, I think that the problem still comes down to the people want to put things on their face when, uh, you know, I say this all the time, we put plastic in our eyeballs so we don't have to wear glasses. Uh, we get lasers shot in our eyes so we don't have to wear glasses. So, <laughs> you know, getting people to voluntarily put on things when they, usually don't want to put on things. It might be a little bit of a, little bit of a stretch, but to that end, they're, they're kind of cool. I mean, being able to take photos from your perspective is fun. I mean, Dan, I imagine- Brad has been dying to try it. I, 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 I kind of do want to try it. And I imagine even me saying that right now, Snapchat <laughs> or Ghostface <laughs> Chiller or Evan Spiegel, is probably sitting here like Soldier Boy, like they copied our whole flow, word for word, <laughs> bar for bar with these glasses. So. Uh, we'll see who Dan, does you got to bring them in if you still have them and let Brad give it a try. He's been talking I'll, about I'll, it. Yeah. I'll do it for sure. All right. All thanks, right. Man. Allie, thanks so much. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Two sports superstars look to be joining forces in a different way. Entertainment LeBron James production company Spring Hill and Peyton Manning's Omaha Productions. Omaha. That's how you say that, are reportedly in talks with Netflix for a basketball-focused show that mirrors the current series quarterback, according to the Wall Street Journal. Now, the big question is, who would be featured in this? And Spring Hill has been doing some consistent work over the years, as well as Peyton Manning, Peyton Manning's production company. I mean, you think about Golden Auctions, really making sure that for both of these in the sports realm, they're figuring out new creative ways to make sure that they're embracing some new and arranging demographic of viewers as well out there. Yeah, I also just think it's so interesting that this is the way that Netflix is approaching sports, yeah. right? It, yeah. It's very, uh, it's dramatically different than what we've seen from a number of the other larger streamers within this space who are paying pretty big bucks in order to uh, get streaming rights for games. Netflix has certainly decided to take a different route, going more the documentary space, the film space within within some of their series that have been very successful. When you think yeah. about Drive to Survive, when you think about Quarterback, which the uh, Manning brothers were behind, when you think about some of their other initiatives, like Breakpoint when it comes to professional tennis, they are, they are able to capitalize on the fact that they have such a large subscriber base, right? Over 240 million subscribers right now, 247 million, making it the world's largest streaming service. So they're leaning into programs a bit differently than many of their rivals. Yeah. And they're pretty entertaining. I love all those shows. So I hope that this is, in fact, right. And they are able to feature some of the NBA players. Have I you, would love it. Uh, look, I, I know you got a few golfers in your household as well. Mm -hmm. Full Swing was great. Full swing was, I forgot about that and one. And the yeah. first the first live production that they're going to be doing on the sporting front is in the sport of golf as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. But on the documentary front, you got to wonder if they're looking for a basketball version of quarterbacks, who they would choose for this. Because Steph Curry. It, I mean, Steph Curry's got to be. I don't know if he would ever sign on. But well, he's good. he's got his own underrated, he uh, underrated, and, and he's got his documentary that's out recently too here. Um, so I wonder, I wonder who they would choose for this. Uh, but yeah, Steph Curry, that would be fun to see. Uh, Giannis might be another big one. International presence there too. Yeah. Yeah, I just saw him giving out some uh, some shoes to all of his teammates so, and all of the uh, staff that's over there. All right, they're telling us to wrap. But anyway, going to be fun. The NBA season kicks off soon too, today. All right, guys, we're, we could talk sports all day, but we got to let you go. We're going to do one more check of the markets here before the top of the hour. And taking a look as things stand right now, about 90 minutes into the trading day, you're still looking at gains across the board. You see the broader markets helped by the strong earnings results that we got before the bell this morning. Also a bit of a pullback here in yields. You're looking at the Dow up just over 300 points, S&P up nearly 1% as well as the NASDAQ. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Rochelle Kufo has you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Here's a look at what I'm watching this morning. Bitcoin's big climb. The cryptocurrency briefly tops 35,000 thanks to optimism over the U.S.'s first spot ETF. BlackRock and Fidelity at the forefront of that push. What could this new avenue mean for the industry going forward? We'll discuss. Plus, a rough road ahead. Despite an earnings beat, GM is raising red flags around losses from a UAW strike. The automaker now estimated to lose $200 million a week. This morning, the union expanding the strike to a crucial GM SUV plant. Meanwhile, Tesla under the microscope. The EV maker disclosing the DOJ has been investigating the company's driver assistance system, vehicle range and personnel decisions. We'll dig into that for you. And bottling success. Coca-Cola raises its full-year guidance after a stellar quarter. Consumers are still willing to spend big, even amid price hikes. But could weight loss drugs create problems down the road? But first, let's check in on how the markets are doing so far this morning. As we can see here, the Dow currently up about 260 points off the session highs, as all these major indices are so far this morning. So losing a little bit of ground, but still in the green. The Dow currently up 0.8%. The S&P 500, they're also down about point, oh, sorry, up about 0.8%, currently up about 33 points. Tech heavy Nasdaq, they're also in the green still, about 119 points. We are seeing Apple, though, weighing on the Dow and the Nasdaq in terms of sectors, utilities and materials leading the charge. Energy, the biggest laggard so far this morning. Let's also check in on the action we're seeing with the Treasury market as well, something we've been continuing to track for you. We see the 10-year pulling back from that key 5% mark, but still, still in that range. We're looking at it currently just up about 0.7% on the day. The shortest term, five-year yield up more than 1% on the day. And the longer term, 30-year yield still solidly on that 5% mark there, but up ever so slightly, up about just shy of a quarter of a percent so far. Well, Bitcoin is jumping this morning, up well over $34,000 as optimism over an ETF launch sent investors piling into the coin. Now, the buzz began when senior Bloomberg intelligence analyst Eric Balkunas noted in a post on X that BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF has been listed by the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, or DTCC, with the ticker IBTC. Now, this follows a filing to the SEC last week that showed a seed capital investor planning to buy shares of BlackRock. Rock's Bitcoin ETF this month. But can investors sustain this optimism and this rally? Joining us now is Octavio Morenzi, Optimus CEO. Good to have you on the show here. So not to take too much of the wind out of the sales of the optimism that we're seeing here, but give us a reality check as to how well-founded this, this optimism, at least for the token Bitcoin is, just based on this news of the, the stronger potential of a spot Bitcoin ETF. Well, it does feel like they're clasping at straws a bit in terms of pushing the price up. I mean, there are other Bitcoin ETFs out there. They're basically in the futures markets as opposed to being in the spot market. But really, in terms of price exposure to Bitcoin, you can get that. And there have been ETFs out there for a few years now that have allowed retail investors to do that and institutional investors as well, for that matter. Uh, they really haven't attracted that much attention. Some of them have around a billion dollars in assets. Most of them have sort of in tens of millions that haven't fared terribly well. So I think this idea that this new ETF, spot ETF, is going to draw a whole bunch of new investors into the Bitcoin market and drive up the prices, generate enough investment volume that's going to push up the price, I think are likely to be disappointed. It just is not that big a market for that kind of investor. Most of the people who want to get an exposure to Bitcoin are quite happy to do it directly and buy Bitcoin directly through an exchange or through a separate account to do that. So I think there might be a bit of disappointment. We might be getting a bit ahead of ourselves in terms of the boost that this is going to give to the market. That's true. We, we heard similar sentiments from Nicholas Panagertzolu of JP Morgan saying any approval won't be transformational for the sector, citing the same examples as we've seen with, with Canada, with Brazil, other countries in Europe that have launched this. Haven't seen these tremendous inflows. So then what's the driver here? Because it's the difference between getting exposure to Bitcoin's movements versus to the token itself. What is the institutional interest here then? Well, I, I suppose it is uh, the difference is really that it's BlackRock behind it. So it's the world's largest asset manager. They're pushing forward a new Bitcoin ETF, basically. And I think there's some sentiment that this is going to attract it and basically make Bitcoin investments sort of 
uh, legitimate for institutional investors as well. And that's something we've really been waiting for for years. I mean, there have been some hedge funds and some investors, institutional investors playing the space. But by and large, most sort of the long only funds, most of the very large institutional investors have sat by the sidelines. And we're always sort of expecting them to jump in now. And maybe that's really what they're thinking, that not only is the people going to invest directly in this ETF, but rather what they're going to do is say, OK, now it's finally a legitimate investable asset class. I can do it. BlackRock's in there. Or pension funds and people like that can now come in in larger numbers. And I think that's the expectation there. But we've seen this many, many times. It's kind of full start many, many times over the course of the past few years, where we sort of think the institutional investor stampede is just around the corner, it's just over the horizon, and it's about to arrive. And I feel that's once again what we're seeing here, that there's a sense that now the institutional investors are going to come. Now that BlackRock has got this ETF up and running, we're going to see all these pension funds and institutional investors come in and, and, and storm the market and drive the price up. But I think that's led to disappointment a few times in a row now. Indeed. And we know that crypto enthusiasts are always looking for that, that next catalyst that's going to drive it. So any bit of positive news, including, the, you know, the SEC is uh, losing its lawsuit against Grayscale, you know, adding to that momentum. But Tempering expectations here. Um, I also want to talk to you about what we've been seeing with bond action as well, because, you know, back in the day, Bitcoin, people considered it some kind of safe haven, especially when there was a fluctuation with what was happening with interest rates. But in terms of the 10 year, do you think it's peaked, the, the yield on the 10 year? I do not think it's big. I've heard a lot of people say this. We've hit 5% and that's somehow a magical level and it can't rise beyond 5%. It's too awful to even contemplate beyond a 5% return on, on the 10-year. Um, and therefore, you should start to pile in. You should start to pile into 10 years, 20-year, 30-year treasuries and get some real exposure to interest rates because they're going to come down. Uh, and bear in mind, of course, as interest rates go down, the value of bonds go up. So if that's correct, that assumption, well, that should be a very, very good investment indeed. And the further out you are, in terms of duration, if you can take it at the 30-year end of the yield curve, well, then fantastic. You have a big exposure to interest rates. If they do come down and that hypothesis is correct, you stand to make quite a pretty penny there. But I fear they might be disappointed. It's not a trade that I'm rushing into making right now myself. I'm basically saying it looks to me like there still might be some upward momentum on the uh, yield curve, on the interest rates, and the Fed might have its hand forced. Inflation is being much more sticky than we'd anticipated, I think, and it's going to look like it's going to carry on this. So the Fed might have to carry increasing interest rates before it starts to decline. And I did go back and look at some of these people who've been predicting that the Fed would now start to cut interest rates. Some of them have been saying this for well over a year, have been very, very disappointed with the returns that they've generated there. So I fear we're going to see more of the same interest rates are going to carry on basically percolating upwards, and that's going to put down pressure on these bond prices. I can't say from my perspective right now, it's a good trade, but it might fit into someone's portfolio depending on your position, but I would keep away from it for the time being. So with that in mind then, you're saying that now is not the time to get into long dated bonds. At what point would you think that would change? At what point, what signals would you be looking for? Well, I really, the signal, I think, more than anything, is going to be that inflation is under control and that the economy sort of seems to need some sort of stimulus and boost. And that is going to lead the Fed to start to cut interest rates again. And that's really what I'd be looking for, a situation where it looks like the Fed is about to embark on a sustained cutting of the interest rates. And that will then generate very, very good returns. But for the time being, I think the very short end of the Treasury of the yield curve is looking very good indeed. So you can get 5.5%. Uh, on the very short end, so the one to six month end of the of the yield curve, uh, for basically taking no risk at all. And at that end of the yield curve, you have basically no exposure to interest rates. That if whether interest rates go up or down, it's not really going to affect your principal investment there. Unlike at the very long end, where it's very sensitive to changes in interest rates. So I think the short end of, of the yield curve is the place to be right now. Park your money there. You can get five and a half percent there. In fact, the yield is higher than it is on the thirty year uh, treasury. So I think that looks like a really good investment. I can't remember a time when you could get basically five and a half percent return for doing nothing and taking no risk. So I think that's a really nice place to be right now. Indeed. Appreciate you joining us as always. A big thank you there. Octavio Morenzi, Optimus CEO. Thanks so much. We're taking a look at shares of GM dipping now after initially rising on its third fiscal quarter earnings. Now, the company beat expectations on its top and bottom line, but the projected financial impact of the UAW strike is weighing on the company's profits as well as investor sentiment. Yahoo Finance spoke to GM's CFO Paul Jacobson this morning about how the company is weathering the impact of those strikes. Here's what he had to say. 
Well, you know, I do think that this is something that, um, you know, when we can get past this and when we can um, uh, prove to the market that, um, you know, we can rise to the challenges of what the uh, the higher costs are going to be uh, while still hitting our goals uh, and our targets uh, that we've we've set out for investors. Um, you know, I think we can recover some of that, but it is going to take some work. Uh, there, there's no doubt this is going to create some inflationary pressure, and uh, we're going to do our best to make sure that it doesn't disrupt us from our targets. But that requires us signing a deal that we know we can be competitive with um, in the future and, like I said, for the next generation. Well, since GM's earnings call, UAW has announced an additional 5,000 workers at General Motors' Arlington, Texas assembly plant. They're walking out today. So joining us now is Yahoo Finance senior autos reporter, Pras Subramanian. Pras, I know you're continuing to follow this story. So what is this doing now to GM and really the narrative around the strikes? Yeah, Rochelle, you know, you just hit on that just now earlier in your intro about how we had the GM earnings today, uh, strong earnings, but they're taking some hits uh, from the effects of the strike. But then also just now, the UAW seeing those strong earnings and saying, you know what, uh, we're going to call all the workers out of GM's full-size SUV plant, Arlington, Texas, to walk off, like you said, 5,000 workers. Uh, that plant makes the highly profitable uh, full-size SUVs like the, uh, the the Chevy Tahoe, GMC Yukon, and the Cadillac Escalade. So. I mentioned before, this was sort of already impacting GM's bottom line. Uh, GM said today that they had to pull their guidance, their full profit guidance for you because they were not sh- they were unsure about when the strike would end, how far it would go, uh, how much of a financial impact it would have. As of right now, it has cost them $200 million in, the, in, in Q3. Uh, and since the beginning, through the start of Q4, it's been $800 million impacted. That's hit their profits there uh, since the strike started by the OW. So the latest move by the OW here with that uh, strike in Arlington, Texas, uh, is going to make that financial pain even worse, I think, for GM here. And you have to wonder then, as other car companies then also report earnings as well, the ones that are involved here, including including Ford, might be wondering about the same backlash when they announce earnings. Is that more likely to happen, do you think? Or are some of these companies doing better in terms of the talks? They're closer at this point where perhaps it, we wouldn't have that same sort of reaction. The UAW said that uh, I believe that Stellantis was the worst stop in terms of the deal that, that they've seen. But then they also said that GM was the GM sort of talks were, were quote, dead in the water with regards to unionization of battery plants, those JV plants that the automakers, the big three are working with, with companies like Samsung and LG. So there's sort of varying different states at each automaker. I think Ford supposedly has the most competitive offer, but GM put out a statement today saying that we we upped their offer to 25% wage increase for, for those workers. So they think that they have a pretty strong offer out there and they're disappointed, they said, uh, after the latest move by the UAW. So I think we might hear more when Ford releases earnings later this week on Thursday. Maybe the UAW might see that see a strong Ford report and say, you know what, we're going to go after some other plants of yours to up the ante and get them, I guess, to kind of come up with a better offer. But the question is, a lot of the automakers are saying we can't go much further. Uh, and now it's we're seeing whether the UAW might actually think about maybe we strike a deal when it's hot as of right now. Indeed, certainly continuing to watch this story unfold and, and hoping for a resolution at some point. A big appreciation to you there, our very own Prize Supermanian. All right, now let's take a look at some trending tickers. First up, shares of RTX surging today on news that the company plans to buy back an additional $10 billion in stock, taking advantage of the sharp decline in share price. Now, the company took a hit this summer when it disclosed quality issues it was having with its latest jetliner engine. RTX said it would cost up to $7 billion to repair the part and compensate airlines for the fixes that grounded more than 600 Airbus jets with inspections due in 2024. Now, RTX CFO saying in the company's earnings call this morning that the timeline for those engine repairs remains unchanged. The company saw high demand deliver better than expected earnings in its third quarter, with adjusted sales rising 12 percent year over year. RTX also agreed to sell its cybersecurity and intelligence business for $1.3 billion to an undisclosed buyer. And we also have our eyes on shares of Overstock popping this morning. The company, which now operates as Bed as Bed Bath & Beyond after purchasing the bankrupt company's intellectual property, announced that it's changing its name to Beyond Inc. on November 6th. It will also transfer its stock listing from the NASDAQ to the New York Stock Exchange, its ticker symbol BYON. CEO Jonathan Johnson said in a statement that the name change is meant to reach millions of new customers while tapping into those legacy fans. Overstock shares 
got a little boost this morning following the acquisition of Bed Bath, but year to date, it's down over 20%. All right, we still have all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. Things aren't getting any easier over at Tesla. Worse than expected earnings, issues over the Cybertruck, and now more investigations. Elon Musk's company revealing its automated driving systems are under deeper federal scrutiny. The EV maker revealed in an SEC filing the Justice Department is demanding info about the systems and a range of company actions. Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan has the details. Hey, Alexis. Hi, Rochelle. Yes. So we knew back in January that the Justice Department had asked Tesla for more information on its autopilot and also its full self-driving systems. But in this new quarterly report, we're learning that the probes are quite a bit wider in terms of subject matter and also a lot more demanding of Tesla. And that's because the prosecutors have subpoenaed Tesla so in terms of they're not asking for this information, they're telling Tesla that the company is required to hand over information. Now take a look at those range of issues there. It's not just autopilot and full self-driving features. The Justice Department also asking for information on personal benefits, related parties, vehicle range, and personnel decisions, they say. Now, Tesla offered no additional detail in the report uh, about these probes other than to say, to the company's knowledge, no government agency in any ongoing investigation has concluded that any wrongdoing has occurred. Now, that leaves us to some speculation. But what we do know is that as for the vehicle range, a number of news organizations have reported that Tesla's stated mileage range for its vehicles tend to not hold up in real life. And as for personal benefits. In August, the Wall Street Journal had a report saying that the Justice Department was looking into whether company funds from Tesla were used to create and design a glass house for Elon Musk. Now, last year also, Reuters had a report saying that the Justice Department was investigating Tesla's past self-driving claims. Though the company does maintain on its website that autopilot is not a self-driving system and that features that it offers like auto braking and lane correction, that those are meant to reduce driver workload, but they're not 
meant to have someone without their hands on the wheel. They say they're meant for fully attentive drivers is the way they say it. Uh, but the big takeaway here, Rochelle, I think that these expanded probes really add to this rough week that Tesla has had after its third quarter earnings call last week, and also to the existing investigations that we know about with the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration. Those date all the way back to 2016. So a lot on Tesla's plate this week, and uh, certainly an expanded and deeper uh, range of probes here into the company and its practices. Indeed. Continuing to keep an eye on that story. Appreciate you getting us up to speed. Our very own Alexis Keenan. Well, Vogue Business is doing a deep dive into your favorite beauty brands and how they handle everything from sustainability practices to brand awareness as companies navigate difficult macro headwinds. Now, The Ordinary emerged as the top performing brand for the index in 2023, with Charlotte Tilbury and Kills coming in close behind. For more on this report, I'm joined by Anusha Kutigan, Vogue Business Head of Advisory. Thank you for joining me this morning. So this is a very interesting index because when you look at what it covered, consumer, digital, ESG and innovation, how did the ordinary end up topping this list? Hi, Rochelle. Well, yeah, it's a really interesting result. One of the things that we've seen consumers expressing more concern over is the economic situation that they're facing everyone is starting to face off to that um, cost of living crisis. And the research that we conducted in six markets shows that globally, 35% of consumers say that if prices continue to increase, they're likely to cut back the frequency of their spend on beauty. And 30% of those global consumers say that they might actually switch to less expensive products. So actually, there's a real, really good reason why The Ordinary has emerged on top. It's a brand that consumers love. It's a brand that consumers see the value of both in terms of the product efficacy and the value of the product. And it's a brand that's going to remain really resilient in that economic situation. But there are other reasons. Um, as you mentioned, we cover ESG and innovation as part of this study too. And one of the things that we've identified with some of the top performing brands, including The Ordinary, is their commitment to sustainability, not just as a business, but how they're making that accessible to consumers as well. So for example, by providing really clear guidelines on how consumers can deal with those products at the end of their life cycle, how they can recycle the products, how they can make sure that they're adhering to the rules and regulations in their local markets. And by making that information really accessible to consumers in a very convenient way, it's enhancing the experience that consumers receive from these brands as well and making sustainability a reality for them. That's interesting because you have the ordinary in there, but, but the other brands that are in there, those are usually pretty quite high price points. What sort of pullback have you been seeing from luxury buyers versus so those who are more budget conscious? Well, I don't think that the pullback has actually fully manifested yet. I think it's something that brands should be readying themselves for. But one of the other things that we've seen with brands that operate in more of a prestige space is that there's real brand love for them. When we compare the beauty industry to the fashion industry, particularly at the luxury end of the market, most brands that people are familiar with in the luxury space have been around for a long time. We're talking about heritage brands that have a history of between 50 and 100 years typically. When we look at the brands that we've studied in the index, actually the majority of those brands haven't been around for that long. Only four of the brands that we studied had been around for over 30 years. 40% of the brands are less than 10 years old. So for some of those brands that operate at the luxury end of the market, there is real brand love for them because they've had a longer history. They've had time to build that trust with consumers. And we can see that with brands like Kiehl's and Nars, for example, there is a true brand love and trust there that's exhibited by consumers. There are also differences between the markets. So we, we look at six markets and we can see that some of the Western markets like the US, UK, Italy and France are already starting to experience some of those economic headwinds. But when we look at markets like the Middle East and China, they remain the most frequent purchasers of beauty products. And actually, they don't have an intention of changing the way that they spend, even if products become more expensive. So Anusha, what are we seeing in terms of spending now, even within the sort of subsections of beauty? Because we know during, during the pandemic when we're in lockdown, people focus a lot more on skincare. What are they spending money on now, where, now that we're at this point? Well, we're seeing that skincare has remained a really resilient category. And surprisingly, you would normally think that that's a category that appeals 
um, to a specific demographic, so particularly uh, more mature women, but actually there's real interest across all age groups. And we're also seeing more interest from male consumers. So 20% of the respondents to our survey were male consumers. And we see that there's a real interest in skincare categories. But what's also interesting is that the brands that tend to appeal to male consumers of beauty and skincare um, tend to perform better if they're gender neutral rather than brands that have a specific range for men. So we're tending to find that those brands that appeal to all demographics that are neutral in their uh, target audience have more of a resonance with male consumers um, than the brands that are specifically targeting them. And Anusha, I want to ask, how do you break through the noise in this sort of environment when you do have so many people com competing for your consumer, your consumer dollars? And then you also have, you know, AI innovations. You have celebrities like Rihanna being the face of Fenty. How do you break through the noise? And where do you where do you see the key disruptors being from here? That's a really good question and a difficult question to answer, actually. I think there are a couple of different ways that brands can take advantage of some of the opportunities when it comes to generating that noise and awareness. Um, if I take Charlotte Tilbury, which was one of the top performers in the index, one of the things that they've been doing is investing in digital innovation. So tools like AR and VR for virtual try of products, but also creating virtual environments where digitally native audiences can engage with them. They've had a collaboration with Disney to create a virtual store that delivers a really immersive experience. And that has helped them to stand out both to those audience, but also stand out in the very competitive digital environment where many of these beauty brands have actually thrived. Um, in Chinese social media, there's a real opportunity as well. We, it's become very expensive for brands to compete in Western social media. And so actually Chinese platforms like Xiaohong Shu and Doyin offer an opportunity to reach new audiences and audiences that actually have an intention of spending more as well. Fascinating stuff there. Appreciate you taking the time to break down this index for us. Anusha Kutigan, Vogue Business Head of Advisory. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we have all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Stocks in the green as Treasury yields back off the highest level in nearly 16 years. The market acknowledging that the Fed could take interest rates are going to stay higher for longer. But could the same be said for yields? For more on this, Yahoo Finance reporter Jared Blickery is here. Jared, break this down for us. Hi, Rochelle. Let's go to what's been happening in the Treasury market, as we can see on the Wi-Fi Interactive today. And uh, we are back off of those highs, the 5.0 level in the 10-year. You can see we are about 12 basis points down from that level, but still quite elevated among not only the 10-year, but all the uh, tenors in the yield curve. Now, let me just show you where we were very recently. This top line is representative of the yield curve. This purple line right here, uh, we are not off of that far uh, we are not far off of that today. A couple of weeks ago, we were at this blue line. And a month ago, a month and a few weeks, we were at this orange line. So as you can see, the yield curve has been shifting quite a bit higher. And although we are off of those highs today, uh, still quite short of anything approaching relief. Now, if the market were to inflect, if bonds were to turn, uh, yields were to turn south from the 5.0 level, that would give equities some breathing room. But uh, we don't have any reason to suspect that it won't be 5.5% or 6.0% right now. We'll have to see how this plays out. Um, I do want to get to uh, some notes that I have about what's going on in the treasury market. Um, if you could, and let me just go back to our yield curve here. This is what the yield curve looks like right now. In normal times, it looks like this. So you can see quite inverted from the normal amount. But in fact, we have been trying to normalize when the yield curve uh, has been racing up on the long end as it has been here. Uh, eventually, if this were to persist, we would see something like this. And that would be a normal yield curve. And normal is good. And that's something that we've been seeing. It's called a bear steepening. Why bear? Because treasury bonds have to go south while their yields go north, um, steepening the yield curve at the same time. And we've had a number of other incidents like this over the past, well, since the great global financial crisis, where we've seen these bull steepenings. And I have a note about this from Haver Analytics. When does the yield curve bear steepen? It happens during periods of reflected improving ISM, that's a manufacturing indication, and GDP growth. The major bear steepening events in the US since 1990 have taken place in 2010, 2013, 2015, 16, and 2021. But you'll notice in this chart here, this blue line is a spread in the twos, tens. Uh, that's the two year versus the 10 year. It went negative around the global financial crisis and it went much more negative only recently. So we're still trying to climb out of this hole. Um, for those who are saying this is like the prior bear steepening periods of 2010 and going forward, I would offer that it looks a little bit different now. So maybe we're not going to see the same result, which was uh, the continuation of stocks to the upside. It looks like we're just we're still trying to normalize right here. And I think it's a little bit too early to say that we're climbing out of the woods here. Hope that uh, that's a little insightful lesson from the bond market for all of us here, Rochelle. Indeed, certainly still trading water around that 5% that mark. So certainly keeping an eye on that. Appreciate you as always. Yahoo Finance reporter Jared Blickery. Thanks so much. All right, taking a look at Spotify reporting its Q3 earnings today, turning a profit. Even though the streaming platform dominates the market, owning over 30% of the sector, still its revenue is slow to grow. And music streaming platforms are actually helping the music sector grow, even though Spotify's guidance was raised for the year. Well, there are more companies trying to move into the space. TikTok rolling out a music sharing platform that could threaten Spotify, Spotify's market share. With over a billion users of TikTok, is there a future where TikTok takes some of that market share? Well, earlier this year, analysts were positive about Spotify. Truist Securities analysts reiterating a buy rating, and Wells Fargo kept its overweight rating. Well, they were right. But what does the future of the streaming industry look like? For more on this, David Shulhoff, Music Inc. CEO, is here to break some of this down for us. Good to see you, David. So, so first, starting with what we've seen with Spotify's earnings and the dominance that it does still have. How close are we to seeing that dominance really being eaten away by the likes of a TikTok? Well, look, TikTok is a, uh, is a force. They have a billion uh, users worldwide. Just think about that. If they turn on the paid revenue spigot, if they get 10%, of those 1 billion users to pay, well, that's 100 million users right there. That puts them in a second position after Spotify. Spotify has 226 million paid subscribers. Apple has 98 million. So think about that. 
that's just an incredible statistic just by doing that. So I think the likelihood of them turning on the spigot is high. They jump, they launched this summer in Australia and Singapore and Mexico. Uh, they have three different plans, individual, family, and student plans. And it looks like they appear to be undercutting Spotify's plan to get traction with their service. So it's very promising. They also have added cool features like Tonic, which is an AI discovery tool. Uh, it incorporates all your music on your playlists. And uh, I'm just amazed that they haven't launched sooner. I guess they had some issues with the labels. Apparently, they got Warners and they got Sony on board. And I think what's holding them back right now in the U.S. is just UMG. But there's some they're definitely a player to look like to look at. Uh, and I would consider them a serious force in the business once they become a paid uh, music subscription service. But that can be a big if. I mean, you know that when it comes to Spotify, they do have their premium subscribers and even monthly active users, gross margins, subscribers, all of that were ahead of a lot of estimates. We saw that for BOA as well. How do you guarantee, though, that you can convert the audience that you see on TikTok to paid streaming subscribers? As we saw with, with Twitter, which now X, you know, really thought they were going to be able to get some of those that, that paid premium content. And people just aren't always willing to spend that extra money in this sort of environment. Yeah, and that's a great question. Look, it all comes down to the user experience. But TikTok is the first streaming social service. So music discovery is going to be a key. Uh, obviously, they have that audience too, that Gen Z audience. Remember, Spotify was a first mover, but their audience now is, is older. And, uh, you know, so TikTok is coming in with a, with a Gen Z audience that is spending more time on their phones than Spotify. So, uh, and like I said, I think they're going to price it cheaper than Spotify. So I think they're going to get traction with it. You know, can they get up to 226 million paid subscribers, which is what Spotify reported today, which was a 16% increase from 220. Uh, we'll see. That'll certainly take some time. But at 1 billion users, if you have 10%, you come in ahead of Apple at 98 million. You come in ahead of Amazon at 82 million. And you come in ahead at YouTube at 80 million. So again, it all comes down to the user experience. I think what's really interesting is just the whole market today is on steroids. Paid subscribers are going from 500 million to 1.2 billion. If you look at the Goldman Sachs report uh, that Lisa Yang wrote. So it's just a really exciting time to be in the music industry. Music in our, in our point of view is the most under monetized media asset out there. That's not just me saying that, that's JP Morgan saying that. That's um, that's Goldman Sachs saying that it's cheap. It's cheap compared to what you pay for all the other content services. Look at what you pay for HBO, for Hulu, for Netflix. So price hikes are definitely taking place for the first time right now. Uh, look, that's why you know Spotify just reported record revenues, 11 percent up from last year, 16 percent growth uh, to 226 million paid subscribers. Um, you know, and, and they reported a profit too. So I think we're just scratching the surface with price hikes. I think what people, what, what consumers are interested in is the experience. They're willing to not just have one, but they would pay for two music subscription services. MUSQ, which is our global music industry ETF, captures all of these companies. We have Spotify, Apple, Amazon, YouTube. When TikTok, if it goes public, we'll have TikTok in our in our fund. We have uh, you know 14 different music streaming platforms. We have 22 content companies. MUSQ captures the growth and innovation of the entire music industry. And by 2030, this industry is uh, is is close to doubling to 152 billion dollars. We'll have $50 billion of recorded music, $15 billion of publishing, $40 billion of live music. Uh, and then mm. when you add on AI and blockchain, just the whole industry is on steroids right now. It is such an exciting time to be in the music industry today. And David, I mean, I have to ask you just quickly about risks ahead. Obviously, price point is important, and especially with TikTok licensing agreements and partnerships. We know they're already under the scrutiny, especially of the US government, as well as some others. What do you see as the biggest risks to what could disrupt the future of streaming, especially as an investment? Well, look, clearly, you know, AI is, uh, everyone's looking at AI, not just in our business, right? So here you have, you know, uh, you have market saturation, you have the threat of piracy, which is something, you know, uh, the industry is dealing with. I mean, that's what the motion picture and TV industry just dealt with when they all the writers went on strike. They were they were concerned about about AI. So clearly artists are worried about their likenesses. You had, you know, the fake 
pirate, you know, recordings of Drake and The Weeknd. So, but but at the end of the day, AI is really boosting production. It's revolutionizing creativity for artists. The benefits of AI far exceed any of the risks. Blockchain, you know, is such an incredible thing. It allows artists and songwriters to get paid on a direct payment rail right now. They don't have to wait a year to get paid. So this is all about the digitization of music. Music today is, you know, of the of the of $50 billion recorded business today, you know, almost 80% of that comes from streaming. Uh, you know, the balance obviously coming from physical sales like vinyl, but streaming is really dominating today. But, you know, but AI is, yes. it, is the big buzzword in our business today. It's true. Other than for sort of novelty reasons, can't remember the last time I bought vinyl. It's all about streaming. Appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. David Schulhoff, Music Inc. CEO. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Coca-Cola raised its four-year outlook thanks to strong demand, signaling customers are still willing to pay up even in the face of price increases. The fears around the impact of weight loss drugs have weighed on food and drink stocks as of late, and Coca-Cola is no exception. Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma joins us now with the latest from the earnings call. Hey, Brooke. Good morning, Rochelle. That's right. Demand for Coca-Cola is still there. If you exclude the impact of Coca-Cola suspending its business operations in Russia, the company delivered positive volumes growth each quarter since the start of 2021. But weighing on the stock is that fear of the impact of weight loss drugs. And when asked on the call by a JP Morgan analyst how Coca-Cola was proactively approaching any potential risk, Coca-Cola CFO John Murphy weighed in. It is an area that we are very focused on. There is still a lot of views out there as to what impact, if any, it will have. I would offer, if you step above it, and look at the, the thrust of our total beverage strategy over the last few years, that we are well positioned to provide choice and to provide options for people, respective motivations and needs. And he went on to say that the company is monitoring this space, but they are confident 
in their strategy with plans to continue to invest in innovation. It's also worth noting that he added that 68% of Coca-Cola products currently have low or no calories today. Yes, I know we're expecting to hear a lot about that from some of these uh, consumer food and drink companies. So then, Brooke, what are some of the other areas of its business that Coca-Cola is focused on? Yeah, Rochelle, well, they did weigh in on, on multiple areas of growth, but three that they provided a bit more color with on the call was their media spend, Coke Zero potential, and some shift in consumer behavior here in the U.S., kicking things off with Coke Zero potential after lapping tremendous growth last year. Unit case volume for Coke Zero did grow 3%. The company added that there is still plenty of runway as they continue to invest behind it and are bullish on its long-term potential. The company also added that they're shifting media spend toward digital marketing, where they're seeing a higher return on investments. And this is also in a bid to reach Gen Z audience, which they say spend seven to nine hours a day on the screen with little or very little time watching traditional television. So they're definitely bulking up digital campaigns. And lastly, interesting note on consumer we're spending, especially here in the U.S., they said that they're seeing more growth in the away from home consumer at things like restaurants, amusement parks, travel, leisure and hospitality. And they said that that's really driving the strength here in the U.S. They also added that they're seeing this divergence of consumer spending in terms of how exactly consumers are shopping to stock up their fridges versus going out at things like, once again, restaurants and amusement parks. Certainly fascinating to always watch what happens with Coca-Cola. Appreciate you so much. Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma. Thanks. Well, there's nothing like an ice cold Coke, but the can's packaging and the energy needed to keep it cold account for more than 60% of Coca-Cola's carbon footprint. In 2022, Coca-Cola's emissions across all scopes totaled 64.9 million metric tons. Now that's more than the entire nation of Ireland. The company has announced initiatives to use more recyclable products in its packaging, but it's still a long way from that goal. And refrigeration still remains a major issue. Joining me now is Bart Elmore, Professor of Environmental History at Ohio State University. Thank you for joining me this morning. So give us a breakdown here, because when you're a company the size of Coca-Cola, available in more than 200 countries, how much of a dent have they been making with their efforts on sustainability? Well, thanks for having me. Yes, it's a great question. Uh, you started off with the stat. You know, they, they operate in over 200 countries and territories. I think the more astounding stat is that they sell about 2.2 billion servings of their product every single day. If you think about the whole population of the world, that's a remarkable feat. But I think, you know, if you step back and think about the environmental implications of all this, you got to think about things like the fact that the company was the single largest consumer of sugar on the planet by the 19 teens. It was, in the 20th century, the single largest buyer of processed caffeine, things we don't think about. So both in the agricultural sector, they have big opportunities to be a leader in environmental sustainability, to think through their process. And of course, there's water. Um, this is a company, based on my calculations, when you include the agricultural components of their business, that uh, basically use the same amount of water that would provide clean cooking, drinking, and um, cleaning water for about a fourth of the world's population. So it's a huge uh, footprint there. And then, of course, plastics. Greenpeace, of course, coming out with a report recently that uh, showed that they were one of the largest contributors to single-use plastic waste out in the environment. But you mentioned it at the top there. I think one thing we're not talking about is refrigeration and recognizing that Coke has about 30 or 35 percent of their greenhouse gases uh, tied to that keeping their beverages cold. And they have worked over the past several years to try and address that. And yet this remains a very, very, very pesky problem for them. So I think we think of plastic, I think we think of water as the main areas where Coke can make a big difference. I think refrigeration is another area, not only where the company has some liabilities to think about, but also where they can you know, make a real dent in trying to change their operations. So then what changes it? Because some of the changes that companies have made have been as a result of sort of customer pushback. We don't seem to be seeing that when it comes to Coca-Cola. What is really going to be the game changer here that makes, I guess, a more meaningful dent in some of these efforts? 
Well, you know, what's interesting. I've been inside the company. I've talked to engineers. I talked to the former chief sustainability officer at Coca-Cola. And on refrigeration, they they have been moved to try and change their operations. Back in the early 2000s, Greenpeace led a big boycott uh, at the Olympics against Coca-Cola, largely for their refrigeration. At the time, they were using hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, which are commonly used by businesses to refrigerate products and coolers and AC units. The problem with HFCs is that they're a thousand times more potent as a global warming chemical than carbon dioxide. So it turns out that the refrigerant in these machines is a big problem. And what Coke has done since 2009 is try and get rid of the HFCs in their coolers, switching oddly to CO2 originally uh, and as a replacement for HFCs as the chief refrigerant in their in their equipment. They've since moved to hydrocarbons, including things like isobutane. I think based on their sustainability reports today, 88% of their new equipment coming out is refrigeration equipment that uses non-HFC refrigerants, which is good. But yet, if you look at their sustainability reports, it's still 30, 35% of their footprint. We talked about the home market and you know getting away from the home market and, and thinking about people being able to buy on the fly. Well, that means you've got those refrigeration units in every little nook and cranny around the country and world that's on 24-7, 365 days a year. One thing I think businesses could think about, and Coke as well, is where do they need cold Coke you know, for immediate consumption? Where might they turn off some of that equipment? Not just thinking about the refrigerants they use, but where is refrigeration needed? And where might it be better just to keep it um, you know, not refrigerated to save a lot of greenhouse gases in the process? Certainly a lot of investments in, in innovation needed there. But, you know, a lot of shareholders were looking at that bottom line and saying, if it ain't, ain't broke in terms of consumers still going at it, it's hard to get them incentivized. But I appreciate you adding that color here for what it really does take in order for, for a can of Coke to, to make it through. Bart Elmore, Professor of Environmental History at Ohio State University. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, the times are changing for one of America's great industrial companies. Back in 2021, General Electric announced it would split into three units. Its stock was a chronic underperformer, and it was time for a reboot for a business that was founded in 1892. Now, CEO Larry Culp said he would create three industry-leading global public companies. Healthcare was first up, and energy arm GE Vernova is set for a spin-off early next year. Now, as the final split nears, the other remaining un unit, Aviation, looks like a clear winner. So was this all part of the plan? Yahoo Finance's Ines Frey is here to break it all down for us. Hey, Ines. Hey, Rochelle, that's right. And yes, it was all part of the plan. Larry Culp's five-year turnaround strategy plan and that next step, the really last step, I would say, is the spin-off of Vernova, its renewable energy unit, which is expected to uh, list next uh, year at the beginning of the second quarter of next year. But let's back up for a second to talk about how the company's latest quarterly results uh, came in. And profit beat Wall Street expectations coming in at 82 cents a share uh, for adjusted EPS. Revenue uh, coming in at 16.5 billion. That was better than what the street had been expecting. The aerospace business by far the best performer. And Larry Culp during the earnings call said that GE Aerospace continues to experience rapid growth driven by demand in commercial engines and services. Also, while navigating uh, supply chain issues, the company's year-to-date commercial engine deliveries are up 30%. So that's significant. And Culp also noted GE's growth opportunity when it comes to defense, uh, talking about a deal with the U.S. Army. And it, the company lifted its guidance for the year, lifting its earnings per share for the full year guidance from its previous target. Now, this all, of course, culminates with this five-year plan that I've been talking about, that the company has been shedding assets, it's been divesting businesses. Back in 2020, it culminated the uh, sale of its iconic lighting business. It also spun out its healthcare unit at the beginning of this year. And Wall Street has liked this, Rochelle. I mean, Wall Street has been rewarding the stock. If you take a look at the stock year to date, by the way, it's one of the trending tickers on Yahoo Finance, number two trending ticker. 
Year to date, it's up 73%. If you look at a full one year uh, chart, you'll see that it's up about 100% from exactly one year ago. So definitely Wall Street were rewarding this stock, rewarding the slim down of what once was a huge conglomerate. And is this analyst reaction surprising? I mean, especially when you look at the stock performance for these three parts of the business. It's not that surprising. I mean, analysts had been expecting, this has been a very laid out plan. Analysts had been expecting uh, these businesses to be divested. They've been expecting aerospace will be what GE will focus on going forward as of next year. It'll be GE Aerospace. It'll still be listed on the New York Stock Exchange as GE, but it'll really be that aerospace business that the company is focusing on its best performer. And right now you've got most analysts that have a buy on this uh, stock and 10 analysts that have a hold on the stock. I think it's 12 buys, 10 hold, zero sell. So certainly uh, the analyst community, Wall Street, is bullish on this stock. At one point, it wasn't so much. Then Larry Culp came in, did that, that turnaround plan. And now uh, the stock you've seen, it's it had a good performance this year and last year. Quite the change for such a legacy business. Appreciate the update. And Esprit there for us. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, well, let's get you a final check of the markets as we head into the noon hour. Still looking at positivity across the board here, although we have seen some of that buying action slowing down. The Dow currently up about 0.6%, about 188 points. We're also seeing the S&P still in the green there, up about half a percent, or about 22 points. The deck heavy Nasdaq there as well. Still up about 90 points on the day, about 0.7% there. We're seeing those Treasury yields stabilizing, so still seeing some of that of now affecting uh, the broader markets here as we want to take a look at what we're seeing actually with um, with the yields. We're seeing also if we take a look at the VIX as well, that's also going down, but still at about 19 at the moment. So still some volatility ahead to keep an eye on as well. But as we can see here, what we're seeing with the yields, the five year still up about 0.9% on the day, the 10 year shy of that 5% mark, but still solidly seeing gains here about half a percent and the 30 year also up ever so slightly. Well, that's it for now. I'm Rochelle Akuva. I'll be back with you at 11 a.m. Eastern. I'll see you then.